approved and we'll move to the next item. Thank you all very much. Okay, uh, commissioners, please note that the next two applications are for advisory reports related to the construction of a new building on the old Commodore Hotel site, now the Hyde Hotel adjacent to Grand Central Terminal. Uh, this site is not designated and LPC has no formal jurisdiction over the new building. Uh, the project's also one of the first bigger projects to come out of the East Midtown rezoning. While it does, uh, this zoning does encourage state-of-the-art state of office construction, it also requires many public benefits, which will be uh, discussed as part of the presentation. Uh, therefore, there are many requirements and other city agencies involved in this project. And in addition, the Public Design Commission will actually have binding jurisdiction over the design. So I'll now read in the, uh, the next two items uh, somewhat jointly, but again, this will be all under one presentation. And it's items seven and eight. Docket numbers LPC 21-05602 and 21-05603, uh, address 71 to 105 East 42nd Street, Grand Central Terminal Individual and Interior Landmarks, uh, the Borough of Manhattan, Block 1280, Lot 1. Again, both are for advisory reports. The first is for advisory review pursuant to Zoning Resolution Section 81-60 concerning the harmonious relationship of a new building and Grand Central Terminal. The second uh, is uh, an application for an advisory report to alter the viaduct sidewalk and the 42nd Street passage to connect an adjacent mm -hmm. new building. And commissioners, uh, the applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, you do okay. Have and before, uh, okay, thanks. So just before we get started, I, I just want our general counsel to speak to the um, types of, there are two different types of reports as Corey said, and I. I just want our general counsel to address that before the applicants begin. Thank you, Sarah. Um, commissioners, um, just to, as Corey indicated, um, the, uh, the application uh, before you is seeking a, uh, a report to the City Planning Commission concerning the harmonious relationship of the new building being built adjacent to Grand Central, but, but not in a non-designated uh, site. Um, is pursuant to the zoning resolution, uh, which is why it's advisory. Um, we are just, we're required under the zoning re resolution to provide this report. Um, with respect to the, um, uh, uh, the other application dealing with the interior work in Grand Central and on the viaduct, um, we're advisory there because um, the terminals owned by the uh, MTA, which is a public authority, and as such, um, is not subject to local landmark jurisdiction. Um, that said, I mean, they uh, instead are subject to review by SHPO. Um, that said, the MTA has um, uh, come forth and, uh, and seeks LPC commissioners comments uh, on the um, proposed work uh, connecting um, these, uh, the, the new uh, construction, the new building with uh, Grand Central. So that's why it's advisory. They, technically, they don't have to come to us at all, but they are coming to us uh, in this advisory capacity. Okay, thank you. And we'll now turn it over to the applicants. Uh, thanks very much, Chair Carroll. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, and, and all the commissioners, uh, it's great to be with you. I'm Jeff Nelson with uh, RxR Realty. I lead our public-private partnerships. Um, we're partnered with TF Cornerstone on the development of 175 Park at the site of uh, the Grand Hyatt. Um, just to touch on RxR and TF for a minute, um, we're firms with, with deep histories and experience in New York, and we're really long-term multi-generational um, owners and holders of real estate with a real commitment to the city and its success. Um, our work spans both commercial and residential projects, um, including a number of high-profile public-private partnerships that we've undertaken over the years. Um, we also have a lot of experience with landmarks and historically significant buildings in the city. So TF um, owns Carnegie Hall Tower and oversaw uh, that project. And, and within RxR's portfolio, we own uh, the New York Central Building, known today as the Helmsley Building, and actually the, the first terminal city office building that was constructed by Grand Central. Um, and we also own 75 Rockefeller Plaza and the Starrett Lehigh uh, buildings and undertook significant renovations of both. Um, and then finally, um, we're currently overseeing the renovation of 550 Madison after its designation in 2018 as a landmark and are very proud of our work there. 
Um, turning to the agenda, um, as Mark mentioned, you know, we're obviously pleased to be at LPC um, at this point. We do have the two items that Mark mentioned to review with you. Um, the application is first for the harmonious report related to our building and its relationship to Grand Central, and then also the uh, appropriateness report um, regarding improvements on the Grand Central lot itself. Um, so just to turn to our site specifically and give you a little bit of the context, um, you all know it well, but we're located at the corner of 42nd and Lex and share um, a block with Grand Central Terminal. Um, there's really perhaps no other site in Manhattan that we think has as much potential um, to contribute both to the public realm and to our transit system. Um, we sit directly adjacent to the terminal and in many ways the site is an extension of the terminal with transit connections and public connections that run from the terminal through our building to the subway below our building and the surrounding streets. Um, and much as the, as the tracks beneath Grand Central inform the construction of the terminal itself, you'll see in our presentation how these circulation elements and the infrastructure both present challenges and opportunities for our site um, as we approached it. Um, looking at 42nd Street today, um, it would be hard to find a site that has more untapped potential than the Grand Hyatt. I think we all uh, know how we got here, um, but to briefly recap, you know, in 1980, uh, a well-known New York developer shaved down the exterior of the old Commodore Hotel and gave us what we have today. Um, this building, as you can see on the next slide, you know, in its design and orientation is imposing and it's foreboding. Um, as you can see, it sits on the lot line and, and actually goes beyond that. It cantilevers over 42nd Street and, and presents a fairly foreboding presence. Um, the impact is probably most prominent with respect to Grand Central Terminal. Uh, it obscures views of the terminal's eastern facade, um, and at street level, it clearly clashes with its kind of magnificent Beaux-Arts neighbor, which is really one of the most important landmarks in the city, if not the most important landmark. Um, unfortunately, that relationship extends to the interior as well. Um, there are severe challenges with pedestrian circulation and access to the transit network. And what you see on the slide is that famously kind of congested entrance along the 42nd Street Passage down into the subway mezzanine. Um, that subway mezzanine and entrance to the 456 actually sits on the Grand Hyatt property. So in the second part of this presentation, you'll see how we improve this condition through the introduction of a transit hall and expanded subway entrance as part of our project. Um, so how are we addressing the current condition? So the proposed project is the demolition of um, the current functionally obsolete hotel and the construction of a new mixed use office building and hotel. Um, as I mentioned, the project will have significant transit improvements and also public realm improvements. And we'll touch on some of those today. Um, you know, when we first embarked on the project, um, it's self-evident, but obviously we recognized immediately the importance of designing a building that respected and sought harmony with Grand Central and that responded to its place next to the terminal. Um, that's why we brought on SOM and Buyer Blender Bell. Um, and we think we've really drawn inspiration from Grand Central. You'll see that we think through the engineering, design and materiality and other details that are included in our project. But this is also a building that stands, we think, in its rightful place as a very carefully designed and contemporary building. Um, it embraces the vision of East Midtown and the intent of the East Midtown rezoning, and it also builds on the legacy of Terminal City. Um, we think it does that through the delivery of its public spaces, which we believe will be world class, the transit upgrades to provide connections to the terminal, and also the construction of a, a modern hotel and office building that meet the needs of a 21st century workforce. Um, we're very proud of the work that's been done. We think this is an incredibly important project, not just for TF Cornerstone and RxR, but also for New York City. Um, as we emerge from this pandemic, hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we really think this project can signal the continued strength and resiliency of New York and the very bright prospects for the city's recovery in the future of East Midtown. 
so I'd like to turn it over to uh, Frank Pryle at BBB and Rami Abu Khalil from SOM to walk you through the design. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I just want to confirm everyone can hear me. We can hear you, Frank. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, commissioners and everyone. I am Frank Pryle. I'm a principal with Bayer Blinder Bell Architects, uh, the firm that hired me over 25 years ago to work on the restoration of Grand Central Terminal. Uh, and in one way or another, I've been working in and around GCT ever since. Uh, I was considering that project just yesterday, in fact, last night as I was reviewing my comments for the hearing today, and it occurred to me that there was a special meaning in the term that was applied to that project. It was not simply a renovation or a restoration, it was a revitalization, and that word was chosen very carefully, and, and I think it's still appropriate and important today. And the reason is that it was more than just, the project was more than just the renovation of public spaces and passageways. Uh, it was, and also more than just the, uh, you know, the restoration of ornament and plaster and stone. I think that with a very few bold and carefully considered moves, th this essential building and the 42nd Street Midtown area around it were given new life. In other words, they were revitalized. And it occurred to me last night, really, as I was reviewing all of these ideas and thoughts, that that's why I'm so excited about the project that we're presenting to you today, because uh, more than any of the other projects I've been involved in in those 25 years uh, that I've begun working at Grand Central, uh, it presents similar opportunities, I think on a similar scale, to address some very evident deficiencies and inefficiencies both within the building, but also in the Midtown area around it, and gives us an opportunity to, to re-revitalize, if you will, uh, both the terminal and this, uh, this Midtown district. So as, as Mark and Jeff mentioned, we're here today because we have applied for two items, uh, which I think could be very broadly simplified to the very big picture, and also, which is the harmonious relationship, and also the very precise. And those are uh, the very uh, specific elements of modification that uh, will be described to you in, in greater detail. And, and the presentation that you'll see in a moment in the defense of these requests is very rich and thoughtfully considered. Uh, and I think that that is what impressed me the mo and excited me the most. When I first saw it, when I, they first, the team first reached out to me to participate in this project over a year ago, uh, the amount of research uh, into Grand Central that the designers from SOM had done, the questions that they asked of me about the building, the very clear and deliberate application of those ideas made me very confident uh, that this project would have many benefits for the terminal and not just be another developer project. So. What are some of these elements and ideas that characterize GCT? And not to go into a log dissertation, but I think it's important to identify the most important. Why have they been so influential? Most important, I think, is its unique and successful balance of the architectural and functional characteristics. And the many tours I give to the building on a regular basis to students and visitors and interested people, I like to describe GCT as a very efficient machine dressed in elegant formal clothing. And the result, all of this comes from is this contentious collaboration sometimes uh, between the designers. Every good team has a little creative friction built into it. Uh, Whitney Warren was a rigorous and disciplined classicist. He worked with Beaux-Arts principles of scale and proportion, ornamentation, solid and void, rich material palette, things like this, and careful detailing to create a building of great presence and monumentality. Uh, and then also uh, as well, the great genius of Grand Central is what we really can't see sometimes and, and, and what we can't, uh, what goes on inside. And that's the integration of, of an extraordinarily complex transit infrastructure uh, and uh, the movement, the seamless movement and circulation within. Uh, so these are the lessons from Grand Central that I think have been directly learned and applied to the project that you will see. And with that, I'll hand off to Rami Abu Khalil from SOM who will go into great detail, hopefully answer your questions. Uh, thank you, and before you, hand it over. I just want to note for the record that Fred Bland, uh, Vice Chair Bland, has, is recused on this item and is not present for this presentation or discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Um, hello, Commissioners. My name is Rami Abu Khalil. I'm part of the design team at SOM who's had the privilege of working on this project, and I'm very excited to be sharing the design with you. We're going to start the discussion uh, of the exterior of our building as it relates to the exterior of the terminal. We're gonna start down at the base and the streetscape because that's where the harmonious relationship is at its most vital and its most important. The terminal was designed to sit like a freestanding object elevated up above the plinth. The current Grand Hyatt rises vertically right at the property line and it crowds the Eastern face of the terminal. 
Not just that, but as Jeff mentioned, it even cantilevers over the sidewalk on 42nd Street. Um, <clears throat> it also features very little architectural scale uh, uh, at the level of hum at the level of the human scale along the sidewalk, and that's very vexing on this site specifically because 42nd Street really does feature a very distinctly human scale that responds to the pedestrian specifically. You can see it in almost all of the buildings around us. But most notably, you of course see it in the plinth of the Grand Central Terminal itself that you see here on the lower right. It concerns us the most because it really defines the character of the 42nd Street, uh, of this stretch of 42nd Street in this block. So our project acknowledges this defining feature, this single story plinth, and extends it into our site in order to preserve that human scale. As we'll explain later also, that extension is gonna allow us the creation of an elevated public realm. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So the terminal is elevated above that plinth and is set back from the street surrounded by circulation. And it features a characteristic rhythm of solids and voids in its facade. In a similar way, the core of our building will also sit above this extension of the plinth. It's gonna be clad in a similar type of stone. It's gonna also feature a rhythm of solids and voids as it gets punctuated by the elevator lobbies. Um, and moreover, as you can see in plan, it's going to more or less align with the main body of the terminal. Both of them are gonna be surrounded by these circulation spaces. So we think that this alignment really helps them read in resonance with each other, along with the materiality and along with this solid void language. Grand Central Terminal is one of the largest train stations in the world. And like many sites in Terminal City, we are sitting right above train tracks that serve the terminal. You can see it here with this looping track uh, uh, on the left. But this is a unique site in that it, it features not only trains, but also subway tracks that cross diagonally across our site. So these are the four, five, six lines that are finding their way diagonally under our site and then up Lexington Avenue. So this site presented a unique engineering challenge from the beginning. How do you land a building here? In order not to affect the operation of these trains and subways, we've identified only two points along 42nd Street uh, where we can successfully land structure without affecting uh, without affecting the train tracks. So we've taken the structure of the building, as you can see on the right side, and bundled it together in order to land on those two points that are available to us on 42nd Street. Now, the terminal expresses its structural piers on the facade. That's what gives it a sense of depth, a sense of relief, a sense of light and shadow. And we've also chosen to generate the architectural language of our building from the expression of these structural columns. They're also going to give the tower dimension, depth, relief, and the structural bundling of the columns will become very legible as it emerges from those load bearing points, those two points along 42nd Street. And then it's going to track all the way up the rest of the tower, as we'll see when I describe the exterior of the building. So the structural solution helps us overcome the structural limitations of the site and it reduces the footprint of the tower. And as it does so, it actually allows us to unlock its potential for the public, and it's gonna to contribute to the harmonious relationship with the terminal. As you can see here, any building that rises straight up from the property line will block views of the terminal as seen from, from the corner of 42nd Street and Lexington. So pulling away from the property line and reducing the footprint of the building is going to help us reveal the terminal to pedestrians. So on the outside of the bulk, you can also here already get a sense of how we're going to use that to really invite the public around our time. And not only that, but pulling, uh, but the way that we're parting that structure also reveals the terminal through this now completely column free lobby. So we're not only opening views on the outside, we're also opening views through the lobby, as you can see here. Uh, as we said earlier, the bulk of the Grand Hyatt where it currently sits really suppresses the reading uh, of the terminal as an object sort of freestanding that you can really experience in the round. 
And so moving the bulk of our building away from the sidewalk really helps to experience that monumental corner that's such a feature of the terminal from the southern side of 42nd Street. Uh, the terminal's mass is the defining feature of this block, and we've paid particular attention to its proportions. And they've informed the way in which that we've detailed the base of our building. As you can see here, as the structure bundles its way down to uh, terra firma, it creates a specific woven pattern with primary and secondary members. And these form meaningful alignments with defining features of the terminal, the statue of Mercury above, the primary cornice line, below. Uh, and so the size of the opening that's created is what is is what then allows that visibility through the lobby that we saw earlier. But it's not so big that it overwhelms the scale of the terminal. We've been very careful to make sure that the proportion of the terminal is still the primary architectural uh, uh, dimension that you see on the block. So that opening is never larger than never higher than the cornice line. A characteristic feature of Beaux-Arts architecture is the deployment of detail at multiple scales, from the scale of fenestration to the fluting on the windows, the profile of the building itself as well. And while our building is evidently you know, firmly contemporary, we're also being very mindful of that and deploying detail at multiple scales as well. So here you see this hierarchy of primary and secondary columns that we've discussed earlier, and the way that within that, we're infilling an architectural louver that's going to add a secondary layer of detail as well. Uh, the terminal's architecture celebrates its columns and it expresses them in the facade in these marching pairs. It highlights them with these very deep flutes that you can see here. And we're also very proud of our columns. We're featuring them with a, subtle, a, a very subtle ribbing that adds texture as they descend towards uh, pedestrians, as they descend towards the human scale. Uh, we're also working uh, with our engineers to make sure that our columns are never so massive that they take away from the monumentality of the columns of the terminal itself. So we're using custom steel buildups. We're using the highest grade of steel available to us to make sure that we can get those columns to be as slender as we can get them. And indeed, uh, right now we're anticipating our columns will be in the four foot eight range, whereas um, the terminal's columns are much wider in the six foot four range. Um, but we've been careful to design our columns so that they have that sense of relief, that strong sense of light and shadow. Uh, it's a facade that really has enough depth in it that we think is appropriate for a building that sits in this location next to the terminal. We don't want this to be a flat building. I think we've all seen that that doesn't work in a location like this. Those columns will be clad in a, in a matte, very warm toned uh, painted metal panel. So the paint has a diffuse reflectivity that will avoid creating distracting specular reflections uh, that could maybe cast reflectivity along uh, back onto the, the terminal, for example, or create a kind of competing, um, competing reflections. So at the base of the building, we've tried to very closely observe the aesthetic ethos of the terminal from this symmetrical balance, the attention to human scale, the ornamentation, and we've tried to apply these lessons in a contemporary way that we think will be harmonious with the terminal. And make no mistake, the terminal will retain its prominence and will continue to be the most uh, attention grabbing element uh, when you approach it from the West. It's still the main architectural gem on this block. Uh, and we think the terminal's legibility as a freestanding object placed on the pedestal that is the viaduct remains clear and unaffected, our building you know, will always read as a backdrop to that. Moving a little bit further east, you can subtly start to understand uh, that the scale of our gesture doesn't eclipse the terminal's prominence. You can also see the way in which we're extending this multi-level circulation logic that's such a characteristic of the terminal into our site once you start to see the way that we're extending the viaduct. And you start to understand that our building is peeling away from the terminal, creating a new space between our building and the terminal. 
up at the level of the viaduct. You can also see that, like the terminal, our building is designed in the round. So it addresses the south, east, and west sides. So it really is in a direct conversation with the terminal. As you can see in this image, the way that it peels away from the property line, creating that generous plaza above, uh, puts it in direct conversation with the terminal. Moving further east, you can see the way that the corner is revealed. Uh, and we're very happy with the way that the terminal does indeed read like, um, like a freestanding monument up on the plaza. Again, as a visual reminder, you know, the current tower sits somewhere out here. And, uh, you know, we think from a pedestrian point of view, it really makes an enormous difference and it really brings value uh, visually to the building. Uh, moving a little bit further east, you also start to see the way in which the terminal's eastern facade starts to become visible through this column-free lobby. And you can also start to see uh, the way in which the core of our building resonates with the terminal. I think pedestrians will clearly understand that there's a sympathetic relationship there formally and in terms of the materials, uh, in terms of the way that they're approximately aligned. We think that will be very perceptible uh, to pedestrians and that they'll read it as sympathetic. You'll see the way we've kept our core very simple and very minimal. It's not overly detailed or, or ornamented in order not to compete with, but really just complement the terminal. Uh, moving further east, you can see the way this single story plinth is gonna extend along Lexington Avenue uh, and also support uh, an elevated plaza above it. Uh, moving further away, uh, this corner will feature a secondary entrance into the building. Uh, and we're working very hard here to make sure that these muscular stone piers that support and receive the, the bundled columns from above are clearly legible so that the structural logic of the building is very evident to, pass to passersby. Here we're on Lexington Avenue. Uh, looking south, and you can see again the continuity of that plinth, the way that it receives this very inviting public space above. And on the right, the way that it meets the one story a Grand Central Market. Below it is going to be a slew of public improvements, including a new entrance into the Lexington Passage, a new subway entrance, a sidewalk widening, um, and access to that terrace above. Um, 175 Park will deliver a new paradigm for how to integrate outdoor public space in the dense fabric that is Midtown. Minimizing the footprint of our building allows us to surround it on all sides with public open space. This creates a continuous network of elevated plazas that's well in excess of the 10,000 square feet that's required by zoning. We're providing almost 24,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space here. Each one of these plazas is gonna become a great new place to appreciate the landmark surroundings. Um, but we're particularly excited, of course, about the what we call the Grand Central Plaza, which is the plaza facing west towards the eastern facade of the terminal. That will become a great new place to really appreciate the terminal. These elevated plazas are reachable by two grand staircases along 42nd Street and a second one along Lexington, as well as ADA elevators on both streets. Um, the terrace sits above, the Grand Central Terrace sits above a transit hall that you see here seen from 42nd Street. It's reachable by elevators and stairs, uh, as we've seen earlier. And here I just want to point out the way in which we've paid very careful attention to the primary shadow lines of the Grand Central Plinth itself in order to extend it into our site in a way, that, in a way that's compatible but doesn't kind of confuse what's old and new. Um, the stone cladding of the plinth uh, we're also still looking to identify but we know it's going to be compatible with this spectrum so uh, between the stony creek pink granite of the the lower plinth and the indiana limestone of the actual terminal above and the once you're up there you finally have a chance to appreciate the terminal's eastern facade which has long been hidden from view on the relatively inhospitable viaduct. And so for the first time, you can appreciate the way that this Eastern facade has just as much detail in it 
as the southern facade or the west facade of the terminal. But it's been so difficult to access all these years. This, the Grand Central Plaza will be, uh, the Grand Central Terrace, sorry, will be a place for relaxation, contemplation. We think it offers a much needed counterpoint to the terminal's hustle and bustle. It features both movable and fixed seating, trees, skylights to the transit hall below, and it's going to be separated from the viaduct with bollards that you can see on the left side of this image. Stairs at the northern end of the terrace will rise towards another elevated plaza towards the north, and that also allows the public a close look at the facade. And it really turns the facade of the terminal into a kind of backdrop for public space for the first time. We're working with James Corner field operation on the design of that landscape to make sure that the materials are sympathetic with the terminal and to make sure that there's certain formal languages here for elements like benches, et cetera, that really draw from the surrounding vocabulary. Grand Central is a famously symmetrical building. So in order for it to sit as comfortably as possible, uh, in order for our tower to sit as comfortably as possible next to Grand Central, we felt strongly that the building had to also be symmetrical so that it's not looming or teetering over the terminal. We also felt strongly that the building should, like a very classical tripartite New York skyscraper, step back in successive tiers in order to preserve light descending to the streets below. Uh, this creates outdoor terraces for the future tenants of the building. Uh, and we know how important that is for the future of workplaces. And finally, it was very important for us not to make this a glass building. I've said it before, but it's worth repeating. We're expressing the structure on the exterior of the facade as a metallic lattice that just very gently and softly drapes over these very typically New York setbacks. So that's what's gonna create depth and relief through the whole height of the tower. This draping also helps soften these setbacks and it creates a more contemporary, organic, very soft form. Um, at the base, we're solving the infrastructural constraints that we discussed earlier with this bundling that hits uh, terra firma in these two points. And then at the top, like the base, we're also resolving it in a kind of woven form that tapers in and also features round corners that can address the city in the round, like a sculptural object. When the terminal was built, it was an engineering feat that bridged a gash in the urban fabric and catalyzed the building of Midtown as we know it. We hope that the engineering feat that it's gonna to take to land 175 Park on this very complex site is gonna be similarly legible to the public and unlock the site's potential, delivering dramatic new open spaces for the public, new transit improvements, and really valorize the terminal for the next century. This second part of the presentation, I'm going to summarize proposed improvements to lot one specifically, so to the designated property. And we just spoke about the harmonious relationship of the exterior of the terminal. This second portion is concerned uh, with appropriateness. Uh, of the improvements that are undertaken to the designated landmark itself. Um, and there are two parts to these improvements that I'm gonna take you through. The first one is a sidewalk improvement at the viaduct level outside. And the second one is a removal of retail storefronts from the 42nd Street passage inside at ground level in order to create connections between the 42nd Street passage and a newly proposed transit hall that's gonna help the MTA achieve its desired increase in level of service. So starting with the sidewalk improvements, uh, lot one is the terminal lot. You're gonna hear me refer, refer to it as um, lot one and lot 30 is the Grand Hyatt. So proposed improvements uh, take place at the boundary between the two. Here you see the condition, the current condition at the viaduct. So lot 30 is everything within the Grand Hyatt's footprint and everything outside of that is lot one. Uh, in orange is the outline of the current sidewalk. What we're proposing is to, on the one hand, extend it, which is this zone you see in blue. And on the other, to improve the paving in this whole zone in pink in order to be sympathetic with the Grand Central Terrace that's gonna be designed next to it. So we want those two things to read um, sympathetic to each other. Uh, 
uh, existing historical features like the historical guardrail that separates the Pew Place from Park Avenue on the left and the, the viaduct parapet itself will remain unaffected. This is an aerial view of that zone that we can return to as needed. The second portion of the Lot 1 improvements happen inside the 42nd Street Passage. As a reminder, the 42nd Street Passage is within the boundary of the designated interior landmark. You can see that in this plan here. Uh, however, its current condition has been dramatically transformed since the original landmarking and, and this plan that you see before you. And the next, in the next few slides, I'm going to try to summarize the evolution of that 42nd Street Passage over time and how we got to where we are and then uh, what our proposed changes to it are. Um, this plan is taken in the, uh, in the 90s before the implementation of the Bayer Blinder Bell Master Plan for Grand Central. I wanna note here the MTA, the entrance into the MTA, which is more or less in its current configuration here on the lower right. So this is this very congested zone that Jeff showed you earlier that we all know. Uh, I also want to point out uh, uh, the, uh, the MTA elevator that had obstructed even then uh, the historic doors into the passage. And I want to point out the configuration of the passage as dramatically different than what it currently is. So you can see here the, the width of the passage is split in two with a ramp that descended down to the lower concourse directly from 42nd Street, and then a ramp that uh, entered and then turned left into the Vanderbilt Hall, but not aligned with the Vanderbilt Hall axis. Um, you can also see here that there is no oyster bar ramp, which is currently a beloved space. Um, Blair Binder Bell's master plan that was implemented in the late 90s was intended to consolidate and simplify circulation schemes uh, within the terminal to better serve passengers' needs at the time. Most importantly here, I want to note the consolidation of the width of the passage. So they eliminated the split ramp configuration. Uh, and of course, the incorporation of retail lining the east side of the passage. That was not the case before that. I also want to note uh, the new relationships. So the opening up of the oyster bar ramp that descended down to the lower concourse. That is now a beloved space, of course. And the realignment of the relationship between the 42nd Street Passage and Vanderbilt Hall to be aligned with the axis of Vanderbilt Hall in this kind of more classical Beaux-Arts way. These are some before and after images. Um, so here we're looking at the doors into the passage on 42nd Street. So we're looking south towards 42nd Street. Uh, and you can see how before the Bayer Bell master plan, the space is split between two ramps. And on the right, the ramps were consolidated. Looking north from that same point on the left, again, those two ramps that really you know, make the space unrecognizable to us and the absence of retail along the east side. Um, and then afterwards, the condition that we more or less know today with the consolidation of the, of the width and the implementation of retail along the passage. Um, these are images of the current condition that we can return to as needed, but again, note that it, uh, you know, the current configuration is more or less the result of the Biobinder Bell master plan. Um, and in red here is the retail zone along the passage that will be subject to some of our modifications. So what is our project? What we're proposing is a new transit hall that will bring the turnstiles of the subway station up from the lower level mezzanine up to grade that will dramatically widen the capacity of the 42nd Street Passage uh, in order to decongest it. Uh, that subway entrance will also be accessible directly from the street, again, in order to decongest the passage itself and decongest the terminal itself. Uh, and in order to achieve the desired improvement in level of service, we've been coordinating with the MTA on increasing porosity between the 42nd Street Passage and this new transit hall. So what we're proposing is two openings, uh, each aligned with an existing axis coming in from the terminal. So one of them with the Vanderbilt Hall axis and one of them with the Oyster Bar ramp axis. So those will increase porosity between the passage and the new expanded transit hall. 
this is a summary slide that we can return to as needed that shows, again, these changes sort of accumulating over time. Really the only thing that I want to note here is that they've always aimed at consolidating and decongesting circulation. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, 175 Park is, an, is a great opportunity to take this into the next century, you know, and really reinforce some of the goals that were set in place by the Blair Binder Bell Master Plan. Here you see a current section through the subway access. So you see on the left is this uh, uh, very uncomfortable and very congested access down into the 456 mezzanine. This section is taken north south. We're looking west towards the terminal. 42nd Street is on the left side of the image. Um, and this is our proposed uh, section through the transit hall. So you can see that because the building is pulling away, our transit hall sits below the Grand Central Plaza that I showed you earlier. Uh, it's gonna feature a direct entrance from 42nd Street. So it'll have also direct visual access out to 42nd Street, which is gonna be great. Um, and I wanna point out the way in which we strategically placed our skylights in order to align with meaningful features of the exterior of the terminal, mainly these beautiful bullseye windows that are such a, such a beautiful part of that facade. And this being a Beaux-Arts building, we're very lucky that, of course, these meaningful features end up aligning with circulation axes. So, uh, so this skylight aligns with that window, but also aligns with the Vanderbilt Hall axis, as I'll show you earlier, uh, later. This is a view within that transit hall. So right now we're inside lot 30. We're looking at the terminal beyond. You can see it. Um, you can see the 42nd Street passage back here. You can also see the terminal through these skylights and you can see uh, its Eastern facade revealed with natural light uh, streaming down. Um, and so both the openings that are uh, at play here that we're presenting to you are this one, that's the Vanderbilt Hall within the Vanderbilt Hall axis and that one which is within the Oyster Bar ramp axis. Here you see the boundary between lot one and lot 30. The materials used in the transit hall will be sympathetic with those used in the 42nd Street passage, um, but, uh, but you'll clearly know that you've crossed a threshold outside of the historical boundary of the terminal and into a, a, a new space. The architectural language isn't identical, uh, but is sympathetic with the terminal. So this view is taken from the northern end of the hall, looking south towards 42nd Street here in the distance. Uh, and this transit hall doesn't connect into our building in any way. It's just purely an extension of the transit systems. Uh, so these circulation portals that we're adding are designed specifically to give the MTA the porosity that it needs to achieve a higher level of service in this transit hall. And here you see the impact on the elevation of the 42nd Street passage with these two openings that will replace uh, retail storefronts where the Oyster Bar ramp is and where the Vanderbilt Hall ramp is, and this expanded opening uh, just to the south of that. Uh, this is a view of the passage looking south towards 42nd Street at the end. On the right is the Oyster Bar ramp. And again, note here the natural hierarchy that ends up happening between the scale of circulation portals and the scale of uh, retail storefronts that tend to read more like punched openings. And so our modifications are designed to continue to promote this kind of intuitive movement that happens uh, within the terminal. So the circulation portals we're proposing are sized to preserve that hierarchy that we think is appropriate. That hierarchy was visible too in Bayer Bender Bell's master plan. You can see, for example, in this image, uh, a little bit further north, the way that the circulation portals are always larger, more, again, more intuitive, they kind of lead you in, and the storefronts tend to be smaller, they're punched openings uh, within the stone surfaces. So we're back in the 42nd Street Passage, looking south. This is the condition, the current condition, and then our proposed condition with taller circulation portals that will kind of intuitively lead passengers into the transit hall. All of the new uh, floor surfaces, all the new wall surfaces within lot one will be consistent with the surrounding materials within the passage. So they'll be, uh, they'll be continuous. Here we're uh, near the entrance looking north towards the terminal. And you can see after our proposed condition, you'll be able to see the transit hall beyond. 
and you'll clearly be able to see the boundary between the landmark interior and the transit hall uh, inside lot 30. Here we're looking south towards 42nd Street entrance and I want to note here the easternmost uh, vestibule, the easternmost doorway. That's the elevator that uh, I mentioned earlier that has been blocked uh, for, for many decades now. And uh, the proposed removal and uh, of this elevator into our transit hall and the restoration of this door to its original condition and its original capacity, again, helping to congest uh, the entrance into this 42nd Street passage. So we're hoping that these changes are appropriate and that they reinforce the Beaux-Arts axiality of the terminal and the beloved spaces that came out of the Bayer Bell master plan as well. Um, I know that we went over this very quickly, but I do thank you for your time and, uh, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. And thank you very much for a, a well laid out and articulated presentation. Commissioners, do we have any questions at this time? All right. I'm not seeing any questions at this time. So why don't we move to public testimony? And we, yes, Commissioner Goldblum. All right, just remembered one. Uh, what is the zoning section that is being asked for uh, review in this case? Um, this is, a. can you hear me? Yeah. David Karnowski uh, from Fried Frank, Thanks. the Land Use Council. Um, 81642 uh, of the zoning resolution provides that when you have a lot that is contiguous to Grand Central that is being developed with landmark floor area that the city planning commission must receive a report from landmarks concerning the harmonious relationship. 81-642? Yes. Now, when you read that, you will see that it has to do with a certain kind of transfer uh, and the transfer that we are making is technically different, but the resolution as part of this project will be amended to make clear that in connection with this particular form of transfer, the same requirement will apply. Thank you. All right, other questions? Okay. Yes, Commissioner Lutfi, please go ahead. Commissioner Lutfi, did you have a question? Sorry, oh, she's muted. So I'm, I'm muting myself. Um, so I, I, I'm just interested in, I mean, it seems that it's gonna be incredibly helpful to open up what sometimes seems, some areas especially that seem a little claustrophobic as you're walking through. What, what you know, with the zoning changes and with the building that's gonna be happening, what is the anticipated uh, flow of people that will be moving through here versus what it is now? What was the number? Can you give us an estimate? Uh, in terms of the overall, you know, employees and so on that will be in the building? Is that the question? Yeah. Pedestrian flow? Well, not only in the building, but in general, just, I mean, I I'm assuming as part of the work that you're doing, you've just been anticipating, not only because of the building, but because of the other developments in the area and the other buildings in the area, that there's going to be an increase in traffic, uh, foot traffic. And um, can you, do you know that? Or can you share that on a daily basis, what it might be during a work? So that's yeah, so so that's um, certainly something that will be studied under the environmental um, review that we're undertaking as part of the ULERP. I mean, the building population itself, um, you know, there'll obviously be an influx of new workers. Um, what we've done with the MTA, and this may help with your question, is with the improvements of the 42nd, along the 42nd Street Passage that Rami went through, and a series of other trans improvements that we didn't get into in this um, discussion, we've actually elevated the level of service throughout the system from fairly subpar levels to, to much better levels with the MTA. So while there'll be an additional influx of, of people, there will also be corresponding improvements throughout the circulation network to address. Right. Does that help answer I your question there? Well, no, I'm assuming that. I was just wondering if you had any numbers. 
Yeah, so we don't have the overall numbers yet. We're studying that as part of the environmental review. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Yes, can I, can I ask? Whoops. You're muted, Commissioner Jefferson. Okay, can I ask an architectural question? And it has to do with the Clint. The Clint is just a wonderful urban amenity. I have a question about the circulation of it. Can you go to the diagram that shows the elevation? So I really have two questions, and they might be. Um, We have a lot of slides. Okay. Yeah. He's there. He's, he's Does this there. help? Yeah, yeah. If you you see the stair, the the, uh, the circulation of these stairs, there, the the architectural reason for placing them in the public realm instead of putting them north and south. What was the idea behind that? Because there's so many people walking up 42nd Street and there. So I thought I was asking what what generated the location of the stair at this particular place. Rami, do you want to take that and talk yeah, about the maybe, transit infrastructure and circulation? Maybe I can take that on and, and maybe one thing that I quickly want to want to try to try to show here is that um, these stairs of course sit within our site. Right, they sit within our property line. They don't infringe on the current width of the sidewalk. And then on top of that, we're also increasing the sidewalk width by an effective five feet underneath this plinth. And so we're working very hard to really decongest the sidewalk there. Moreover, um, I just wanna show you quickly into axonometric, uh, at the point where these two stairs actually meet the ground, so again, all of this is happening within our property line. Our property line is out here. Okay. Yeah. okay. And so the stairs are within the property line and we're expanding the sidewalk by up to 17 feet here at the base in order to make sure that there, we're not adding to the congestion, but that we're actually helping with the congestion. Thank you. And then the second question is that the, the if you go back to that perspective that you showed before, um, the, yes, this one, where this one, where you know the the structure coming down is like a curtain coming down. My question was, and you can see through it. My question was the ceiling of the lobby. Um, how does it relate to the total structure of the landmark? In other words. If I'm inside uh, from this view, would I only see a portion of the landmark or would I be able to see more? Should it be higher? What, what defined the height of that interior ceiling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are, Jeff, should I take this one? Yep. I, so there's structural considerations right now that are determining what the height of this uh, lobby is. And, you know, we're also not trying to, you know, design the tallest tower in the city. <laughs> in the city. That's not the, the expressed aim of this. So we're trying to be uh, conservative and not create a space that is so tall that it starts to compete with the proportion of the terminal itself. I don't know if that, uh, if that kind of makes sense. Well, I, I think it's a, you know, it's a beautiful, you know, the beautiful lobby. So I was just questioning whether I was just questioning whether it, you know, how the ceiling was uh, decided upon. But I, I think it works. And I think if, if, if I saw more and I walked in from outside and I could see through the building and see more of Grand Central, it would be quite beautiful. Just a suggestion. Ah, from the interior of yeah. the building, I understand. So from the exterior, as I'm walking through, I look through the glass corridor and I see the Grand Central from exterior. That perspective that you just showed. Go back Got to it. that perspective. Got it? Okay. Thank you very much. That's uh, so, so the other one. This, there's another one. 
that way. So I'm across the street, I can see straight through diagonally to the building, right? Through the glass entrance, the second glass, and an actual view all the way through. It could be very dramatic. Just, just an idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay. We may have uh, more questions after the testimony, but why don't we move on to the testimony portion right of our hearing right now. And if you are in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And uh, as always, we will start with anyone who signed up in advance first and then get to everyone else. And I'll turn it over to our executive director, Lisa Kersavage, to walk us through the testimony. Lisa? Hey, great, thank you. And um, perhaps we could move to the testimony slide as well. Um, and I just wanted to alert everybody who plans to speak again, as Sarah said, to raise your hand. Um, we're gonna be calling people that signed up in advance. Uh, we'll call those people first, um, then followed by anybody else who has their hand up. And um, please, when I bring you into the room, um, you'll get a request to unmute yourself. Um, and then you can also turn on your camera if you choose. And then please state your name for the record. And again, you just, you have three minutes. So I'm going to start with Rob Burns from East Midtown Partnership. Followed by uh, Matthew Clark. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rob Burns. I'm president of the East Midtown Partnership, which is a Manhattan business improvement district. <clears throat> Today, I'd like to uh, support the proposed project Commodore uh, plan for 175 Park Avenue next to the Grand Central Terminal. Terminal City and the Grand Central ter Terminal area were originally designed as catalysts for density. And the area includes some of the most notable skyscrapers of the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, with the corner of East 42nd Street and Lexington Avenue once hailed as the world's greatest skyscraper corner. The Grand Hyatt site at that corner has been a missed opportunity. By contrast, the fluid contemporary design of 175 Park is in keeping with the historic nature of Terminal City. In addition, by pulling away from the south and west property lines and creating a large glazed lobby, the design of 175 Park will reveal the ornate eastern facade of Grand Central Terminal, with new views creating harmony between the proposed design and the landmark. And the creation of a network of public plazas starting uh, up at the viaduct level will allow the public to appreciate the terminal up close, as well as adding needed public space. <clears throat> Finally, the recent East Midtown rezoning plan was meticulously formulated to realize the original vision of Terminal City uh, while delivering on critical policy goals like spurring investment in transit infrastructure, enhancing the public realm, and modernizing the neighborhood's aging office stock. 175 Park delivers on the promise of the East Midtown rezoning on all fronts by creating the type of density the Grand Central Terminal was, was designed to encourage. Opposing the building because it is tall and modern goes against the goals of East Midtown rezoning. This project will deliver on, that long, on those long-term goals and in the interim will provide many well-paying construction jobs. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this exciting project. Okay, thank you. So next we have uh, Matthew Clark. Okay, Matthew, I've promoted you as a panelist. Um, you'll be followed by Maria Free and then followed by Tara Kelly. Hi there, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Matthew Clark. Uh, I am the executive director of the Design Trust for Public Space. Uh, our or organization is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the future of public space in New York City. Uh, I'm speaking today in favor of 175 Park Avenue, and in particular to its proposed relationship to Grand Central Station and on proposed changes to the 42nd Street Passage. 
Uh, Grand Central Station is one of New York City's most important public spaces, uh, an entrepot of movement to and from the city and a proud symbol of our indefatigable spirit. The rezoning of East Midtown has created opportunities to reimagine this neighborhood. The project under review today will positively contribute to the neighborhood by improving contextual understanding of Grand Central, by vastly improving the transit experience for New Yorkers, and by adding new public space for the community. In terms of the harmonious relationship to Grand Central, the proposed design accomplishes several important goals. First, it reveals the three-dimensional and volumetric majesty of Grand Central by improving view corridors of the station's east facade, as can now be experienced on the western side. The proposed Grand Central Terrace will not only promote a new appreciation of Grand Central above plinth level, but it also provides an impetus to reimagine the Park Avenue viaduct potentially as a, a pedestrian space in the coming years and decades. Uh, as a trained designer, I'm appreciative of the team's choice of materials and detailing. It is responsive to the intent of the station, yet applied in ways that are contemporary and forward facing. Uh, additionally, while our organization focuses on public space, space, we take the widest possible definition of that term. In New York City, there is perhaps no more important, interesting, and vibrant public space than our subway and mass transit systems. As we all know, our region needs significant investment to, investment to ensure these spaces can serve our city for generations. I'm incredibly supportive and enthusiastic of the changes proposed to the passage and to the larger transit experience in Grand Central and the 42nd Street subway complex. The proposed changes will transform the rider experience and will also improve the understanding and unity of Grand Central Station. Uh, and it's for these reasons I'm testifying today in support of the project application. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Okay, next we have Maria Free. And Maria, I've brought you in um, to be followed by Tara Kelly and then um, Fatima Asia. Hi. My name is Maria Free, and uh, on behalf of the New York Building Congress, we are proud to support the development of 175 Park Ave. This project is a milestone in the continued evolution of one of New York's most iconic neighborhoods. And it delivers on the promise of the East Midtown rezoning and responds appropriately to Grand Central Terminal. The Building Congress has, for 100 years, advocated for investment in infrastructure, pursued job creation, and promoted preservation and growth in the New York City area. We represent over 550 organizations comprised of more than a quarter million professionals. The Building Congress believes that 175 Park Ave is the right type of investment for New York. The design responds to Grand Central's role as a catalyst for dens density, which was first demonstrated in the historic vision for Terminal City, and more recently through the East Midtown rezoning. Much like one Vanderbilt, which the Building Congress also supported, 175 Park Ave will replace an outdated structure with a new sustainable tower that promotes significant private investment in public infrastructure. This type of density delivers large scale improvements to the streetscape and transportation network. It is harmonious with both the spirit and architecture of Grand Central. 175 Park Ave signifies engineering excellence and enhances the public realm. It's an engineering feat that will improve sight lines and the flow of foot traffic in Grand Central, the subway, and on the street. Moreover, the project will add significantly more open public space than what is required under the rezoning. The network of public plazas will open Grand Central's eastern facade to the public, and people will finally be able to appreciate Grand Central up close. The project will also provide new vantage points to the Chrysler Building and other Midtown icons. In closing, 175 Park Ave echoes the ethos of Grand Central and the neighborhood. It respectfully increases density by transforming an underused site into a state-of-the-art building and enhances the public realm with transit improvements and new open space. The Building Congress proudly supports this project and we urge you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Tara Kelly followed by um, Fatima Apia and then Kelly Carroll. Hello, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Tara Kelly speaking on behalf of Municipal Art Society. The dictionary definition of harmonious is forming a pleasing or consistent whole or free from dis disagreement or dissent, 
Neither of these descriptions apply to the relationship between the proposal for 175 Park Avenue and Grand Central Terminal. The project team states that their intention was that 175 Park Avenue make referential gestures to Grand Central in recalling its Beaux-Arts symmetry, relating the express beams to the fluted columns, connecting the above grade open space to Pershing Square Viaduct and stepping back at the street line to open up views of the previously obscured Eastern facade of the terminal. However, none of these efforts result in a successful dialogue with the neighboring landmark. First, the amalgamation of columns on the four corners of the base are a busy distraction from the visual impact of the terminal. The configuration of the columns results from the engineering challenge of improving the maze of subway platforms beneath, an outcome that is extremely desirable. However, the column flutes are superhuman in scale and their termination at the deck of the plinth is abrupt. Secondly, the facade of the base is grossly out of scale and not convincingly referential to Grand Central. The pedestrian experience, especially coming from the east, will be visually overwhelmed by 175 Park, its entrance and staircase. Though the improved circulation to the Pershing Square Viaduct is a welcome addition, it does nothing to enhance the visual experience approaching Grand Central and may, in fact, obscure the entrance to the landmark. It is not just the base that has a negative impact. The overwhelming density and dispiriting design of the rest of the tower should not go unmentioned. The building's footprint alone competes with the scale of Grand Central at the base and then overpowers it with the immense height and bulk of the tower above. It is worth noting that the enormous density results from a series of bonuses as well as a zoning lot merger that were never anticipated to be taken in total in the East Mid Midtown rezoning process. While the finding of harmoniousness is narrowly focused on the relationship to Grand Central, it cannot be ignored that this new building will overwhelm one of the nicest ensembles of 20th century skyscraper architecture in New York City. The tower's windswept setbacks have no reference points to the Chrysler building across the street or anything else in the Midtown skyline. 175 Park is a series of extruded boxes more appropriate for Dallas or Dubai. Finally, the squat stump of a crown stands in stark contrast to the Chrysler's exuberant and elegant spire. In the end, Project Commodore, as proposed, is an interruption to the experience of the Grand Central Terminal and the historic buildings that surround it at both the sidewalk and the skyline. Although there is no clear criteria for a finding of harmoniousness, the commission need only refer to its own discussion of one Vanderbilt. In 2015, it was stated that along 42nd Street, harmoniousness constitutes a visual relationship wherein a new building will not detract from the impact of Grand Central. With this in mind, it seems impossible for the commission to find that 175 Park Avenue meets the standard of harmoniousness. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and next we have uh, Fatima Asia. Um, he'll be followed by um, Kelly Carroll and then followed by Ryan Kukos. Okay, Fatima, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Hi, can you hear and see me now? Yes. Okay, great. So my name is Fatima Afia. I'm an attorney at Hiller PC, and I'll be reading a statement on behalf of Michael Hiller of Hiller PC. We represent Christabel Goff in opposition to the application. I trust that the commissioners are aware that the Landmarks Law was enacted in response to the demolition of the old Penn Station, one of New York's most iconic architectural achievements and culturally significant places. Some 55 years later, New Yorkers still talk about the loss of the old Penn Station and the importance of city council's response. I promise you all that in the generations to come, New Yorkers will be talking about what the commission does today with respect to this application. I won't lecture you about the Grand Central Terminal or its architectural and historic significance. I will state simply that it is among the most recognized and important landmarks in New York, if not in the country. The application proposes to construct what would become one of the largest, if not the largest buildings in New York City directly adjacent to the Grand Central Terminal. To comment that the proposed building would overshadow, obscure, and ultimately render irrelevant the Grand Central Terminal would be a classic understatement. Simply put, if this proposed building were to be erected, Grand Central Terminal may as well be de-designated de as an historic landmark. No one is going to see, much less look, for Grand Central Terminal when it stands in the shadow of a hulking 1,600 foot tall adjacent building. The relationship between the proposed mega tower and the low lying Grand Central Terminal would not be harmonious. It would constitute an affront to Grand Central Terminal, the city and the landmarks law itself. 
Aside from the aesthetic and landmark preservation considerations before you, I will add one more matter to consider. The procedural error of evaluating the application under the auspices of the report and recommendation provisions of section 25-318. I heard staff and council suggest that the commission does not have jurisdiction over this application because the property in question is not designated, nor is it located in a historic district. However, the presentation materials more than suggest that the work would require alteration of the Eastern facade of the Grand Central Terminal, including its viaduct, both of which are designated landmark improvements. The MTA, while a public benefit corporation, is not city owned or even state owned. Section 25-318 of the Landmarks Law by its plain terms pertains only to city owned properties and scenic landmarks. This application should therefore be evaluated based upon the criteria set forth in section 25-307, specifically as a certificate of appropriateness. Certificates of appropriateness are binding, not advisory. Thus, the procedural error of evaluating this application in the context of a 25-318 report and recommendation, as opposed to a certificate of appropriateness under 25-307 is significant. We recognize that Mr. Silberman disagrees with us on this point, but we respectfully ask him to reconsider his views on this issue and the commission to delay issuance of a report and recommendation until this legal issue is finalized. I'm sure I can speak for everyone when I say that it would be a monumental failure of the landmarks law if this application were to be viewed by posterity similarly to the way we now view the demolition of the old station. We urge the commission to defer its consideration until the procedural and legal issues can be fully addressed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Kelly Carroll, followed by Ryan Kukos, and then followed by Judith Dupre. Historic Districts Council. The Historic Districts Council thanks the applicant team for the presentation tailored to our organization. It is evident that substantial thought, creativity, and consideration for both the proposed new building and Grand Central Terminal has gone into every aspect of this proposal. We have no objections to the modification of the 42nd Street Passage and Viaduct Sidewalk, both of which are appropriate interventions and improvements. The public amenities of the proposed development will facilitate a harmonious relationship with Grand Central Terminal from an experiential standpoint. The stairs which lead pedestrians up to the Park Avenue viaduct are a nod to the inviting circulation inside the terminal itself. This proposed public space above grade will allow people to have a moment with Grand Central's east facade as a backdrop for the first time. Currently, there is nowhere to ponder and enjoy any facade of Grand Central Terminal for any amount of time without being in the way of pedestrian or vehicular traffic flow. So this amenity is most welcome. Regarding the relationship between the two buildings, HDC does not feel that the proposed building is as human friendly as the terminal or the other landmarks in the immediate vicinity. We believe this is because the building appears to ascend from the ground instead of from a base or a plinth hierarchy, which is characteristic of all neighboring buildings. HDC understands that this is a challenging site to develop because of our city's major arteries directly beneath it. The engineering solution is truly remarkable, but we struggled to translate this engineering expression into how it will feel as architecture on 42nd Street and the experience of its proximity to pedestrians. This building's robust engineering system deserves to be viewed in the round, but this location cannot provide a plaza for it. In conclusion, HDC feels that another look at the hierarchy, massing, and pedestrian scaled experiences of other ground floors in this area should be further studied in order to make this building more at home in Terminal City. Thank you. Great, thank you. Kelly, you were cut off just at the beginning. Could you say yeah. your name for the record? So that was Kelly Carroll from Historic Districts Council. Um, okay, so Ryan Kukos, I'm bringing you into the meeting, um, followed by Judith Dupre and Danny Pearlstein. Okay. 
Okay, uh, my name is Ryan Pukos and I am a senior project manager mm -hmm. with the Grand Central Partnership. Uh, the Grand Central Partnership is the business improvement district serving an approximately 70 square block area in Midtown East surrounding Grand Central Terminal. Uh, on behalf of our district management association and its board of directors, we welcome the opportunity to comment on 175 Park Avenue. As one of the world's largest bids serving a district with 73 million square feet of commercial, residential, and retail building space, our goal is to keep our Midtown East neighborhood clean, safe, and thriving. Doing so involves supporting projects like 175 Park Avenue, which we believe creates harmony with Grand Central Terminal and the surrounding neighborhood in several ways. First, 175 Park Avenue fulfills Grand Central Terminal's role as a catalyst for density. Grand Central Terminal and Terminal City help pave the way for the development of some of the most notable skyscrapers of 20th century America. 175 Park Avenue's design, from its brilliant engineering to its fluid contemporary form, is harmonious with the historical trajectory of Terminal City into the 21st century. Second, 175 Park Avenue creates harmony through visibility and access to the terminal's eastern facade. The terminal has long suffered from a lack of visibility from the east. By pulling away from the property line on the south and west and by creating a large glazed lobby, 175 Park Avenue will reveal the terminal to pedestrians approaching from 42nd Street and Lexington Avenue. Additionally, the creation of a network of public plazas starting at the viaduct level will allow the public to appreciate the terminal's eastern facade up close. By creating these new ways to, to appreciate the terminal, the design of 175 Park Avenue valorizes the landmark and creates harmony. Finally, 175 Park Avenue delivers on the promise of East Midtown rezoning by harmoniously respecting the historic character of the neighborhood while solidifying the area's position among the premier central business districts in the world through investment in transit infrastructure, strengthening the public realm and modernizing aging office stock. For these reasons, we urge the commission to find that there is a harmonious relationship between the proposed design of one <laughs> and Grand Central Terminal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and to everybody that's um, an attendee, I'm not sure what happened, but all of the hands were lowered. So if you could once again, raise your hand if you haven't spoken and would like to speak, that would be really helpful. Okay, next we have Judith Dupre, followed by Danny Pearlstein. And Judith, I've brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Hello, commissioners. I'm Judith Dupre. I'm an historian and infrastructure consultant. My books on architecture and engineering include skyscrapers, published in a dozen languages, and the first history of the New World Trade Center, a project that also demanded intelligent transit solutions and improvements. I'm speaking in support of 175 Park. One response when a building adjacent to an historical structure is to design a facade that reflects and defers to the older structure. It's a good solution used successfully in cities around the globe. 175 Park, however, pays homage to Grand Central Terminal in ways that are entirely new, harmonious, and wholly authentic. Grand Central's meaning arises from one essential noble function to move nearly a million people in and out of the city every day. Outside Grand Central at the moment, the streets are far too congested for anyone <coughs> and admire the building. You really can't get a good look at it until you're inside with your ticket and a few extra minutes and can see its extraordinary ceiling and architectural detailing. 175 Park offers a solution and an opportunity. It responds to many critical issues above and below ground with great civic generosity. 
175 Park has been brilliantly engineered. Its structure meets 42nd Street at only two points, allowing the base of the building to be opened up, creating multiple public areas. It is wrapped on four sides with public terraces that will allow people to finally see and appreciate Grand Central Terminal. And I have to add here, given some of the comments that in London at SOM's Bishopsgate project, and this is, um, a complex of buildings where steel supports are also intersect with the public, pro, uh, public plaza, that there is a powerful, visceral thrill, trust me, to be in the presence of a skyscraper's actual structure. Back in New York, the building's aesthetic and materiality complement and contrast its neighbors. Its structural steel columns rise like a blossoming flower writ large, revealing Grand Central's exterior ornamental sculpture, as well as the organic Art Deco lines of the Channon, Chrysler, and Graybar buildings. The bundled steel columns also make a vertical visual reference to the train lines that run beneath it, the metaphoric lifeblood of Grand Central. Grand Central's Elegance and excellence calls for a bold and helpful neighbor like 175 Park. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next we have Danny Perlstein, followed by uh, Francoise Bullock, uh, John Graham, and then Mark Bench. Hey, Danny, I've brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair, um, Commissioners. Uh, thanks so much for having me. My name is Danny Perlstein. I'm the Policy and Communications Director at the Riders Alliance. We are New York's grassroots organization of subway and bus riders. Uh, like with one Vanderbilt, which we also supported, um, this application you know, represents a really tremendous transit improvement for New York riders. Um, I can think of three, you know, primary facets of that. Obviously, the, the opening up of the mezzanine, which, you know, everyone knows now is a, is a rabbit warren and impossible to see through or, or easily to get around despite the tremendous numbers of riders who need it every day. And then, of course, um, the stairwell up from there um, to the, the uh, Vanderbilt Hall level to the street level, um, which is dramatically opened up um, with this design so that there, you know, there isn't just that one little tiny you know, diagonal staircase and, and an escalator, but but really, you know, the opportunity for the throughput that, that people need here. And I think what, what all of that adds up to really is much, much better access from the subway, you know, which has felt, you know, in many respects, like an afterthought in Grand Central, but we're really now tying the two inextricably together, providing excellent access to the terminal from public transit, you know, for everybody on the four, five, six, seven and shuttle. Um, that this, you know, really transforms that experience, you know, at least as much as, as the one Vanderbilt side does um, on the other direction. Uh, so we are um, very enthusiastic about the transit benefits of this project. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Francois Bullock. Francois, I don't see your... Okay, Francois, I've brought you in. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please just state your name for the record. So my name is Francois Borac, and I'm uh, testifying today on behalf of the City Club of New York as um, the chair of its preservation committee. Good afternoon, commissioners. We do not want to spend much time parsing what makes this building so inharmonious with Grand Central Terminal. It is too painfully obvious that this oversized, an overexpressive tower with pantaloons is not harmonious. It is too big, too muscular, and frankly, it could be anywhere, across town, in Houston, in Dubai, wherever. The Hotel Commodore and other buildings designed as a part of the Terminal City development complemented Grand Central for many years by forming a consistent frame for it. These buildings were related to each other by their height, materiality, and relationship to the street. 
This is a disaster that has been a long time in the making, starting with the unsympathetic, unsympathetic skinning of the undesignated original Terminal City building on this site. A new harmonious facade would be welcome for this historic structure, steel structure, that does not seem to have any difficulty reaching terra firma. It doesn't. But the current design is merely an outgrowth of the structural limitations imposed on the new building by the underground activities of the terminal and the surrounding terminal city. The terminal city development and the associated transportation elements are still a functioning, significant urban and architectural achievement. The commission has the responsibility to designate the unprotected buildings that remain from the original terminal city in particular the Roosevelt Hotel and the Postum Building. The Roosevelt Hotel and the Postum Building remain as examples of how to be a good architectural neighbor. We urge the commission to reject this proposal as obviously inharmonious with Grand Central Terminal and to immediately designate the vulnerable undesignated buildings that were part of Terminal City. In particular, the Roosevelt Hotel and the Postum Building. Otherwise, very soon, we will meet again to review similar proposals for those sites. Thank you for the. Good afternoon, Commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society of New York. The Victorian Society does not in any way find the relationship between Grand Central Terminal and the proposed new building to be harmonious, and we hope to persuade the Commission to share our view. If we at the Victorian Society were cynical, we could imagine that the real estate community, abetted by some city officials, were exacting payback against Grand Central Terminal for its starring role in the most important preservation law case in US history result in the finding that landmarks preservation laws are constitutional. Our cynical selves might say this proposal allows us to visualize their payback with the new building's parasitic attachment to the terminal's viaduct, sucking the seemingly endless supply of belt and rights out and up to its towering crown. But we are not cynics, so we will dutifully address the minimal role given to LPC in assessing the proposed transfer of development rights. The heavy lifting required by the zoning resolution has already done been done by previous projects. The terminal is in good physical condition, there is a continuing maintenance plan, and presumably the plan is being followed. That leaves harmonious relationship, and apparently neither the Landmarks Commission or anyone else has to find one in order for this project to move forward. The Commission need only issue a report concerning the harmonious relationship, a bit of linguistic leisure demand from our City Planning Commission that renders a once reasonable concept nearly meaningless. It is our view that the architectural relationship between Grand Central Terminal and the proposed new building is not harmonious. The proposal meets not a single criterion for being an architectural good neighbor. First and foremost is the height completing the transformation of the terminal. From the low scale centerpiece and focus of a dense mid-rise masonry commercial district to an out of context remnant, crowded and crushed on every side by enormous glass towers. The conceit of rendering bits of the landmark visible by cutting away portions of the new building further minimizes the terminal's presence to something akin to a bauble in a museum case, rather than a cohesive part of the city's architectural fabric. The new building speaks a wholly different architectural language than the terminal, using none of the grammar, syntax, and vocabulary that allows buildings of different scales and styles to, stick, to be comfortable with each other. Notwithstanding the diagrammatic representations of the proposal's human scale. Its features are extremely assertive, overpowering, and disorientingly curved, bowed, and angled, especially at the base, where it is experienced adjacent to the terminal. We urge the commission to use its unfortunately limited jurisdiction to make the most forceful case possible that the new building's relationship with Grand Central Terminal is not only not harmonious, but will do ser serious urbanistic damage to this landmark. We will continue our testimony with a second speaker. Thank you, commissioners. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Mark Bench, followed by Claire White, um, Tri-State Transportation, and then Eleonora um, Bershedskaya. Excuse me. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon. This is Mark Bench for on behalf of the Victorian Society. The second application is for a report concerning alterations to the designated Violet Sidewalk and 42nd Street Passage. 
we find the proposed work in the much altered passage to be appropriate because of the hierarchy and form of the proposed openings, use of matching and harmonizing materials and reopening of the third historic doors to 42nd Street. Outside, we wonder why the work within the development easement area within lot one shouldn't require an application for a certificate of appropriateness rather than a report. If it were possible to separate the proposal for the expanded viaduct sidewalk from the new building behind it, it would save the simple paving materials and bollards aren't out of character within the small forecourt to the hotel entrance that apparently has existed there since the Commodore Hotel opened. Taking a broader look at the totality of this enlarged pedestrian space, including the part not on the landmark site, but which may be relevant to considerations of a harmonious relationship, the simple paving, seating and low planters won't detract from the visible portions of the viaduct and the terminal will allow this perspective to be more broadly enjoyed by the public. However, we question the appropriateness of trees in this location. But for all the open spaces additions around the tower, the work at the 42nd Street Passage and the adjacent and related new transit hall, we are not sure the applicant deserves credit for solving congestion problems that seem largely of its own making. There are other public realms, there are other, there are other public realm problems, not of the applicant's making, however, that we believe should be addressed. One is the lack of a bike route on the viaduct. But more importantly, we have major concerns about the original ornamental lampposts, which were temporarily removed from the viaduct 30 years ago and miraculously have survived in storage. It is the latter the point that the remainder of our testimony will be directed. We have provided relevant photographs for our written testimony. Slides 54 and 68 note that historic metal railing on the east side of the viaduct and the stone parapet around the rest of the viaduct will remain untouched by the project. Both the railing and parapets provided the plinths for the extraordinary bronze and cast iron lampstanders that historically encircled the terminal until they were removed in a failed Department of Transportation project 30 or more years ago. Instead of being returned to the viaduct, the lampposts were disassembled and stored in the warehouse, where they were catalogued by a former LPC executive director and a member of the staff. Those files might still be in the Commission's office. Two of the lampposts were restored by Metro North and installed at the northern end of the Park Avenue viaduct a few years ago for the centennial of the terminal. The rest, 18 or so, have been awaiting the right combination of priority and funding. We don't necessarily suggest that the fate of these lampposts should be wholly determined by the future of the proposed new building. However, the Victorian Society hopes that the interest and advocacy of the Landmarks Commission will ensure that the time is right for priority and funding to finally come to restore this long missing original feature to the viaduct, the terminal and the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we have Claire White, followed by Tri-State Transportation and then followed by Eleonora Bushka Gaia. Um, thank you. Um, Chair Carroll and commissioners, my name is Claire Wise. I'm an architect and urban designer. And I'm submitting testimony here today on uh, really behalf of uh, myself. On its merits, um, the Grand Hyatt redevelopment application, I think is carefully considered. For the first time, bringing together multi-level, this multi-level, really complex public transit by reconciling much needed public space improvements. The proposed design reveals an architectural strategy that like Grand Central Terminal itself, literally grows out of its transit infrastructure. The public rooms, halls, steps, and elevators at multiple levels and scales will finally fully connect the train halls with the subway lines. It is for this reason that the design is at once a visionary work for New York City of architecture and one that makes sense with harmonizing with the central position of Grand Central. By making the building narrow at the base, the SOM design carefully negotiates a subway station and the Metro North tax below. I think creating a new kind of indoor outdoor space. At the same time, this project is, creates an altogether new kind of connected public realm, both at the viaduct level, which has not really happened before, the street level and the concourse or train hall level. And that's really what Grand Central has always needed. Whereas the current Hyatt 
intrudes all over the transit infrastructure, contributes absolutely nothing to either the transit network or the sidewalk, crowds Grand Central and obscures its Eastern facade, this proposal opens up a new public space between itself and Grand Central. It makes a special public space to appreciate the view and I believe will increase the visibility of Grand Central, the terminal itself. It will open up the Eastern facade of Grand Central and create in turn a Western facade in response to it rather than relegating this whole area as a lot line or side yard condition. The space will be the start of new uses for the viaduct in the future when I hope cars are guests and the viaduct is not just simply a single use public space for cars. This responds and acknowledges the important potential of the terminal's three dimensionality, um, I believe. The curving forms, I think they are a contemporary statement that is rooted in the building's structural expression this is being um, carefully shown uh, in the presentation and it reflects its connections to the below grade foundation. I think it pragmatically plays with a biomorphic symmetry. And in this way, it does have the excitement of a building built in the century, yet plays off the classical and ornament ornamented solidity of Grand Central Terminal and its focus on 42nd Street. The importance of the Grand Height proposal May, what the importance that it makes of their central and public entrance on 42nd Street really echoes that uh, frontality and that symmetry. New views of the terminal will be open for all different vantage points along 42nd. Some of these views are through transparent column-free openings that result from collecting the building structure and bringing its columns to just two points on 42nd. This creates a, a thrilling dialogue between the different centuries that will have produced each of the buildings. I think this dialogue is fundamentally harmonious. And finally, the transparency at the base of the building reveals not only glimpses of the terminal, but views of a new stone structure, an unornamented one, which is the core of the new commercial tower and hotel, connecting to the stone of Grand Central, but as an interior space without the decorative elements of Grand Central, making a harmonious, not jarring experience when going through both spaces which commuters and workers alike will do often. This is another layer of harmony and dialogue with the terminal. The effort to understand and enhance the context of Grand Central with both new public space and an important addition to New York skyline in alignment scale, materiality, and rhythm of both solid and void is something to look forward to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Tri-State Transportation, followed by Eleonora, um, Bershevskaya, and then followed by um, Dan Biederman. And just to remind everybody, I'm still working off of the list of people that signed up in advance. Hi, my, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Hi, my name is Felicia Park Rogers. I'm the Director of Regional Infrastructure Projects for Tri-State Transportation Campaign, an organization that fights for safe, fast, and fair transportation options that reduce car dependence in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. I'm here today as a transit advocate to express our support for 175 Park Avenue to redevelop the Grand Hyatt New York site adjacent to Grand Central Terminal in Midtown East. It is hard to find a more transit rich development spot in the five boroughs of New York City. Our support primarily stems from the enhanced subway and commuter rail station circulation as well as the significant accessibility improvements beneath the proposed development. We are also quite pleased with the public green terrace surrounding the tower. Our review of the project leads us to conclude that it is, a design, that it is designed in such a way to honor the historic place of Grand Central in our city's transit and architectural history, as well as responding to the needs of the modern transit user. Before the pandemic, overcrowding of Midtown Transit Hubs was a major issue and it is expected to continue to be a problem when restrictions are lifted and workers return. This project and the proposed transit hall improve both wayfinding and circulation space, both greatly needed under the current configuration. It expands the passenger capacity of both Grand Central Terminal and the connecting 42nd Street subway station, while also providing vital connectivity to the soon to be completed Eastside access terminal tracks. As Manhattan reopens for business this year, it will be crucial that we move ahead with this project and projects like it to provide a better, more efficient and safer commuting experience. 
This investment in transportation infrastructure and public space will not only encourage the use of public transit at one of the city's largest hubs, it will demonstrate that urban development projects can be successful by acting like urban development projects. That is recognizing the availability of public transit, developing densely to take advantage of existing infrastructure and contributing to the community by developing public amenities and public space. More broadly, New York City Council should encourage dense development near transit hubs like this one. The Department of City Planning project projects that New York City's population will grow to 9.1 million by the year 2030. With our city's population on the rise, we need to encourage people to live and work near transit in order to improve road, road, conge road congestion. That means building densely near transit hubs like this one. We all know our public transit system is in crisis. Last year, transit ridership plummeted as COVID-19 shut down, orders kept much of the population at home and ridership levels are expected to take at least a few years to fully recover. If we fail to transform our transit system to appropriately handle future demand, we will fail to bring back riders, we will fail and we will add to the congestion that is choking our streets. According to the Partnership for New York City, this costs our region approximately $20 billion a year in lost revenue. In a time where we need to encourage people to use mass transit in our cars, we should be bold about developing densely, but thoughtfully around transit hubs. This proposed project is a good example of both. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Eleonora, I just brought you into the room, followed by Dan Biederman, and then followed by um, Ronald Nicky. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, my name is Eleonora Bruschatskaya and I'm reading testimony prepared by Ken Smith uh, from Ken Smith Workshop. Dear commissioners, I'm writing in support of the proposed public spaces and urbanism of the 175 Park Avenue project. From an urbanistic position, the proposed building at 175 Park Avenue shows a carefully thought out and sensitive relationship to the Grand Central Terminal, which for too long has had its Eastern facade hidden from the public by an adjoining building. By pulling the new building away from the Eastern facade of the Grand Central Terminal, 175 Park Avenue makes it possible to experience the terminal as a freestanding Beaux-Arts object building. From my perspective, the gift of creating publicly accessible open spaces at the level of the Grand Central Viaduct and wrapping all four sides of the proposed new structure with an elevated landscape terrace promises to be a game changer in providing much needed green space along the Madison Avenue corridor and its intersection with 42nd Street. The architectural gesture of reinforcing the datum of the viaduct at the base of the new building is effective in extending the base of the Grand Central Terminal all the way from Vanderbilt to the corner of Lexington and around the corner to the Gray Bar building. The elevated position of these proposed open spaces with landscape, seating, and respite will provide vantage points for viewing and experiencing the area's cityscape in a new way. Although not part of this project per se, the proposed design also opens up the possibility to dream of a future when the entire viaduct might become a car-free public open space, knitting together this part of the city into a broader public realm experience. Thank you for the opportunity to express my opinion Ken Smith. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and next we have Dan Biederman. Followed by uh, Ronald Kopnicki and then followed by Jared Dworkin. And Dan Biederman, I've brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you, somewhat different from the normal Zoom. I'm the executive director of the Bryant Park Corporation. I asked Skidmore to show me the plan because my initial concern was uh, the bulk and shadows on the park. One Vandy has some of that, although we like the building very much. Um, and in the course of reviewing the presentation, I was impressed in five or six major ways, some of which don't have to do with the harmonious finding that the commission has to make, but I think are nonetheless important. Um, 
in our district at 34th Street, which I also had, uh, Skidmore did a terrific job on Moynihan in my view. And I think the train circulation um, efforts are clever and somewhat reflect the quality of Moynihan, which is really having a terrific effect after, after a month on the neighborhood at 34th Street that desperately needs that kind of work. Uh, obviously, people will refer and have referred to the bulk. We believe there's no better place to put a massive amount of bulk than 50 feet from Grand Central Terminal and its trains. Um, and are always surprised that so many bulky developments proposed right on top of train nodes are opposed by a lot of civic groups. And we think this is a, a good thing for the city. Um, the, in the course of the discussion with Skidmore Architects about the east side being revealed, um, when, I, when I ran Grand Central, we had lit the other two sides of the building and were frustrated we couldn't lit the east side. So this opens a terrific opportunity for someone to uh, light that side of the facade uh, and complete the lighting uh, on all three sides. And with the last, with regard to uh, uh, tra foot traffic and the like, uh, looks like 9,000 people may be added as a result of this building, minus whatever number of people were working or uh, visiting the Grand Hyatt. Um, and a lot of them I'm sure will enter from within as a result of the transit connection. So uh, my experience in the neighborhood is that number, whether it's three, four, five, six thousand, spread over a long period of time, is not going to make a dent in the already crowded conditions, uh, pre-COVID, obviously, of uh, Lexington Avenue sidewalks and the like. So, for all those reasons, we think uh, the neighborhood will be better. Um, uh, New York needs this kind of bulk in the right place, um, and we support the application. Okay. Thank you. And next, Ronald Kupnicki. And then the last person on the sign-in list is Jared Dworkin. Okay, Ronald Kupnicki, I brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ronald Kupnicki for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Experience suggests the futility of advisory reports, but for the sake of precedent, one must object to any pretense that this proposal enjoys a harmonious relationship with the landmark. It does not. The new building, designed as a freestanding work of art, completely independent of its surroundings, ignores history it ignores the lingering importance of the former classical stone-faced terminal city that once enclosed the landmark. Terminal city still survives in the retained massing of the old Commodore, now a Hyatt Hotel. Scorning the architecture of the past in ways that Mies van der Rohe did not when he designed the Seagram building nearby, SOM has designed a curvaceous anti-urban monolith. The problem perhaps is not so much the 83 story height as the way it's supported. The putative sculptural quality of the base is disorienting, exposing the multiple structural supports and treating them as freestanding decorative features suggests little more than the difficulty of creating rentable square feet in the interstitial spaces while supporting the vast bulk above. And thanks for the generous gift of public space where you can sit in the shade next to a roaring river of traffic and breathe in the carbon monoxide exhaust. Maintaining a perpendicular west wall beside the viaduct on the former Depew Place side should be a requirement, not just for public health, but to retain that historic sense of enclosure provided by what still remains of the massing of our beautiful lost terminal city. After the wartime bombing of Rotterdam, the city center was left with nothing but rubble and a street pattern. The peacetime destruction of New York is different, not simultaneous, but more serial, one site at a time, not for a nation struggling to win a just war, of course, but for more private purposes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Jared Dworkin, and then I'll move to everybody that has their hand raised. Hello, 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jared Dworkin. I am reading written testimony prepared by Nader Tarani of Nada Inc. Dear members of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, it is with pleasure that I write this brief letter of evaluation for 175 Park Avenue. By way of introduction, I currently serve as the Dean of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture of the Cooper Union, while also leading my own firm, Nada Inc. Prior to my arrival in New York, I was the head of the Department of Architecture at MIT, where I taught for eight years with prior teaching appointments at both Harvard Graduate School of Design and Rhode Island School of Design. On this occasion, I have the luxury of having reviewed the schematic drawing documents of 175 Park Avenue. And while it is a significant addition to the New York skyline, I was impressed by the strategic handling of its base where the urbanism of the street would most be impacted by any such intervention. Part of the complexity of this project seems to stem from its relationship to Grand Central Station and the two ground planes from which the building may be accessed, not only on 42nd Street, but also the raised viaduct Park Avenue that circumnavigates Grand Central Station. If this were not sufficiently complex, the connection of this site with the Great Hall of the Station the subway lines and the entire lower levels of infrastructure that drive the considerations of its foundation is what makes this proposal very smart. Instead of allowing the normative descent of structure onto the base of the building where the views of Grand Central would be blocked and many of the train lines below compromised, the building's southern edge bundles all its structural columns into two pylons. With this simple yet heroic gesture, the building's corners are allowed to elevate revealing the main facade of Grand Central Station, which is also recessed from the street edge. If 175 Park is resolute in its symmetry, structural expression and rational logic, it is also actually more deft in its asymmetrical handling of circulation trajectories at its base, linking it not only to the station lines, but also the viaduct on oblique desire lines. The transparency of the base also reveals an architectural logic that extends the stone treatment of Grand Central Station into the core of 175 Park. Thus, the base is treated almost as a quarry, carving out of the stone the key elements that drive all the promenades that connect the public to their very destinations. The top of this base then is treated with more intimate gardens, courts, and terraces, all of which play into the setback logic of the massing of the building, stepping back at key intervals with the tower's graceful ascent. The building thus straddles a fine line between working harmoniously with Grand Central Station while also contributing a new icon to the city in its own right. In effect, the ground is designed in deference to Grand Central Station while the top is speaking to the scale of the city, its skyline and its legibility for miles away. Indeed, a difficult balancing act, but done with strategic poise. I am happy to speak in more detail should my voice be necessary, but I understand the important mission of the Landmark Preservation Commission, the urban design agendas that drive our respect for the city and the importance of recognizing our place in history in the face of architectural landmarks that precede us. Respectfully, Nader Tirani. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, uh, Sherida Paulson, followed by um, Abre Bokhari. Hey, Sherida, you should just be able to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Let's see, Sherida, I'm not sure you're here. I just sent a request to unmute yourself. No, you there you go. Off that Lisa? Yes, we can we can see and hear you. <laughs> okay, sorry, I can't hear anything. Uh. Okay, my name is Sherida Paulson. Is that okay now? Yes, you're, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you. It's Sherida Paulson from PKSB Architects. Um, I, I only come and speak at the commission when there's a personal aspect to this. So I am grateful to have been one of the commissioners who voted on the Buyer Blunder Belt plans to revitalize the terminal. And I want, wanted to take the opportunity to speak today because 42nd Street is a ribbon of landmarks from Tudor City at the east to McGraw Hill at the west, our home at PKSB for the last 40 years. And there are obviously multiple buildings in between. This new tower continues the New York City tradition of looking ahead, building future landmarks and looking for that brighter future. The new building proposed to replace the Commodore Hotel and its unfortunate glass skin takes care to reveal the terminal from the east in proposing a tower that is located centrally on its footprint and tapers its form. It also maintains the important gap of 43rd Street to allow for sunlight to come into the double walkway wall on the east side of Grand Central. The new tower is clearly delineated as a completely separate structure from Grand Central Terminal and distinguishes itself from the Grand Central Jewel. The proposed tower's materials of transparent, very transparent glass and painted metal cladding reduce reflectivity and potential for uncomfortable glare, all in all a most harmonious solution. The viaduct connection and 42nd Street passages, while many have commented on the appropriateness issue, the bottom line is these changes are entirely appropriate to this building. Um, they are superb amenities, well designed to complement the material palette. The viaduct level improvements expand the sidewalk, preserve the historic railing and connect to the larger public terraces proposed around the new tower. The 42nd Street passage modifications are tremendous improvements providing much public benefit, but they preserve historic pathways, provide much needed space to Grand Central for visitors and transit patrons. The surgical removal of small retail spaces to accomplish these relationships is, is a wonderful way to activate the Grand Central terminal and allow the public to enjoy this. I support both of these applications for reports and urge the commission to issue favorable responses on both items. I have a small design quibble about the staircase material. It should not derail, sorry, this application in any way. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarada. Okay, next, Abre um, Bokhari, followed by Emily Bach. Hi, my name is Aubrey Bukhari and I'll be reading written testimony prepared by Kate Asher. Chair Carroll and commissioners, my name is Kate Asher, professor of urban development at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, former partner at Borough Happold and author of The Heights, Anatomy of a Skyscraper, The Works, Anatomy of a City, and most recently, New York Rising, A History of New York City's Development. Thank you all for allowing me to testify in support of a project that I see as both an important extension of Grand Central Terminal's historic purpose and spirit, and an answer to many of the challenges it faces as a 21st century transit hub. Since its earliest days as Grand Central Depot, the terminal and station have functioned as a catalyst for transit-oriented development. In the 19th century, the original station gave rise to hotels and retail amenities unmatched in the city. In the decades following its redevelopment and branding as Grand Central Station, surrounding blocks became home to the city's second office district, comprised of some of the most iconic skyscrapers of 20th century America, and reminding us of the bold thinking that typifies the city's architect architectural fabric. The now obsolete Grand Hyatt sits on what was once hailed as the world's greatest skyscraper corner. Unfortunately, the site today fails to live up to the spirit of integrated transportation and development so important to the Grand Central Block and instead serves as an unforgiving foil to the historic terminal. 175 Park Avenue seeks to rectify that. The proposed building will restore a sense of vitality to this corner next to the, one of the city's most important transit hubs through exciting and innovative engineering that builds on and integrates the transit and public realm underpinnings of the terminal itself. 
It is, along with the one or two sites opposite Penn Station, among the locations most suited to high density development in all of Manhattan, connecting tenants directly with transport and minimizing congestion on streets and the surrounding sidewalks. Not taking full advantage of this proximity would be a missed opportunity. At the time, the original construction of Grand Central Terminal was no small feat. The combination of the large transparent openings and complex ramping systems that constitute the terminal's design were a direct response to uniquely challenging conditions on the site. Facing similar constraints, namely the subway platforms, rail lines, and commuter passages that sit below the Grand Hyatt, the 175 Park Avenue design team has identified equally innovative solutions. The design presented today is rich with creative engineering and design thinking that allows the building to rise up through the station below, greatly rationalizing and improving general mobility, the user experience, and the neighborhood's public realm. Even more so than one Vanderbilt nearby, the transit components to this project are of incalculable value to users and to future visitors to Grand Central. Indeed, no other site in the district could provide them in such a comprehensive way. 175 Park Avenue enhances the commuter experience through a new transit hall and a dedicated subway entrance, improvements to the subway mezzanine, and a new and much needed below grade connection to east side access and the Metro North tracks. Together, these improvements will greatly improve circulation and reduce congestion, allowing Grand Central to accommodate not only the increasing flows of commuters expected upon completion of east side access, but also the vast number of visitors to New York who never take a commuter train, but instead come to celebrate and enjoy an important and Mark. Simply put, this project is a critical component in ensuring that future growth and commutation, both from Long Island and Westchester, can be accommodated without undermining one of the great buildings and public spaces of our city, Grand Central Terminal. The question of harmony before the commission is undoubtedly an important one. 175 Park Avenue very much radiates the spirit of the majestic 1913 remake of Grand Central, achieving harmony with and improving its surroundings by cleverly stacking underground connections and passageways to maximize mobility and by creating much needed open space around the terminal itself. It does so in an, um, in an undoubtedly bold and modern way, but with very much the same engineering and public realm inspirations as the original terminal. This project is an unparalleled opportunity to put density where it most belongs, quite literally on top of transit and simultaneously honor one of the city's greatest landmarks as it moves into its second century of service. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So next we have Emily Bach, followed by Will Noyes. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. My name is Emily Bach. I'm reading written testimony for Greg Pascarelli from Shop Architects. Chair Carroll and commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on this important project for our beloved city. My name is Greg Pascarelli, founding principal of Shop Architects here in Lower Manhattan. The redevelopment of the Grand Hyatt site presents the challenge of creating a 21st office building in setting with important historic landmarks. Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill have designed a bold tower with impressive public and transit realms to ensure the Grand Central Tower will continue to shine as one of our greatest landmarks. As we all know, the most sustainable thing we can do for our cities is build density next to mass transit. This project is the definition of that goal and will help to ensure that an important nexus of our city represented by Grand Central will continue to thrive well into the 21st century. This is what Grand Central wants most of all. 175 Park Avenue will be an impressive contemporary contribution to Midtown. The proposed building tapers inwards at its base, providing much needed relief to the urban space around Grand Central. This not only exposes the terminal's Eastern facade from 42nd Street, but allows for an abundance of new public space situated at the viaduct level. This valuable addition to Midtown's public and civic realm will serve as a viewing platform that enhances Grand Central's presence and allows pedestrians to experience a landmark up close and at a human scale. The building's materiality from its express structure to the transparent core demonstrates a comprehensive approach to creating harmony through greater visibility and access to Grand Central. It does so at a scale that responds to the terminal and its signature features and flourishes. 
The 175 Park facade introduces texture and articulation, taking cues from Grand Central, but in an exhilarating new way. The last thing we need is another textureless all glass tower. SOM has boldly threaded the needle between a contemporary design and one that connects with city at multiple scales. Through its confident contemporary form, 175 Park Avenue will achieve harmony through contrast. It will remind the public of Grand Central's enduring history while also making it a vital part of our present and future. Rather than leave Grand Central in the past, let's bring it along with us and let it be a vital part of the century as well. Respectfully submitted, Craig Pascarelli. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, Will Noyes, followed by Helene Sank. Good afternoon. My name is Will Noyes, and I'm reading written testimony on behalf of Annabelle Seldor. Dear Ms. Carroll and Commissioners, I write to you today to express my enthusiastic support for Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill's proposal for 175 Park Avenue. It is evidently clear that SOM has carefully and thoughtfully considered the relationship between its proposed project and Grand Central Terminal, how the proposed building meets the ground, how it responds to and enhances the architectural character and function of the magnificent Grand Central Terminal and how it impacts the quality of the pedestrian experience along 42nd Street and in the underground networks below. 175 Park touches down with a slightly tapered massing and encircled with public space at the elevated height of the viaduct, providing breathing space as well as new access from which to appreciate Grand Central Terminal. This is no small feat to achieve. Sitting on a challenging site above an infrastructural hub, the terminal itself was highly innovative for its time. 175 Park meets the terminal's ingenuity with its own. Other gestures, such as the building symmetry and setbacks, reference the architecture of the terminal, as well as other nearby landmark, the Chrysler Building. I believe the exposed structural system has been used to great effect. A modern nod to the ornamentation of both Grand Central Terminal and the Chrysler Building. The geometry and the relief and texture of the ribbed cables of 175 Park creates a dynamic synergy between the historic landmarks that, the, that is the contemporary, uh, com while remaining true to the 21st century era belongs to. Furthermore, 175 Park greatly enhances the public realm, both below and above grade. The improvements to transit infrastructure below will help future-proof Grand Central Terminal, easing congestion and enhancing safety. The creation of the new public space above is a much needed addition to the area for tourists, commuters, and office workers alike. It makes a physical connection between the two buildings. There are many layers of history in New York City. Respecting these layers and the architecture of previous eras does not mean mimicking them. 175 Park is big, bold, and innovative, much like Grand Central Terminal was over 100 years ago. It harmonizes with the terminal in its various massing, aesthetic, and functional choices. But more than that, 175 Park pays homage to the most quintessential New York City structure, its attitude. Sincerely, Annabelle Seldor. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I think our final speaker, Helene, thank. I think you're good to go. We can see you. You can see me? Okay, great. Hi, yep. my name is Helene Sklin. I'm the Deputy Director in the Transit Oriented Development Group at the MTA. And today I'm here to provide the, transit, the transportation planning perspective for the proposed improvements connecting Grand Central Subway Station with Grand Central Terminal in conjunction with the redevelopment of the Grand Tide Hotel. As you know, Grand Central Station is served by three subway lines. The Lexington line, which is the 456, Flushing line, number seven, and the shuttle. The northerly half of the Lexington line platform, which runs diagonally under the Hyatt, are among the, most subway, sub, sub, are among the subway systems most heavily used. Most of the exiting is concentrated at what we refer to as the R238 exit. The majority of passengers exiting the subway make a beeline for the high concentration of office buildings on Park Avenue, Madison Avenue, and Fifth Avenue, north of Grand Central Terminal. Walking through the main hall of Grand Central Terminal, 
This Northwest flow through the main hall of Grand Central Terminal is the largest passenger movement to and from the Grand Central subway station. MTA's primary goal in developing the transit improvements with the Hyatt developer was to create new access to the center of the Lexington Line platform. This access would be aligned with the main passenger flow to the Northwest and the main hall of Grand Central Terminal. A new center diagonal stair from the terminal street level down to the subway mezzanine level would accommodate six pedestrian lanes. Engineering constraints of the terminal put this new diagonal stair only in one spot, which then requires the main fare control area, the turnstiles from the subway mezzanine level to be relocated up to the terminal level. This additional transit capacity requires additional circulation space at street level, which is provided by the space referred to as the new transit hall, directly east of the 42nd Street passageway. This design requires direct sight lines and circulation to the stair from primary locations in Grand Central Terminal. Lack of transparency or connections between the transit hall, Grand Central Terminal, and the 42nd Street passageway will inhibit the efficacy of transit improvements delivered as part of this, as part of this project. It's imperative that the transit hall remain open to both the Lexington Passageway and the 42nd Street Passageway as currently planned. While we understand a desire to demarcate where Grand Central Terminal ends and the lot 30 begins, the demarcation between the terminal and the transit hall can be accomplished through the use of distinct yet sympathetic materials to the terminal or other architectural features, which would provide visual clues and delineate the boundaries of the landmark without sacrificing the sight lines and physical connections through this passageway. The, 40, the 42nd Street passageway has been modified many times over its life in order to meet the evolving demands of the terminal. And we believe that this modification is one that will appropriately accommodate growth in intermodal moves in a manner that is functional and appropriate for the historic terminal. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I don't see anybody else with their hand raised. Sarah, we can't hear you. All right, Rich, do we have any additional written testimony? Yes, we do. We do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 5 and they recommended de denial of an LPC report stating there wasn't a harmonious relationship between the proposed building and the Grand Central Terminal, but recommended approval for the passageway improvements. We also received seven letters in support, including some from individuals and organizations who spoke during testimony, and six in opposition, also including from some individuals and organizations who spoke during testimony. Okay, thank you. All right, I'd like to turn back to the applicant team and ask if you would like to address any of the comments raised in the testimony. Uh, I think we'd like to um, speak very briefly in response to uh, some of the testimony or the response we know that we received, for example, from uh, Community Board 5. Um, and we'd like to say that uh, in response uh, that we had reached out in a very proactive way and uh, we respect and are very grateful for the suggestions and the feedback that we received. Uh, we'd like to underscore that we were very responsive even in advance. We had a very proactive and robust uh, uh, community outreach program, which of course uh, included the community board, which was an obligation, but we also spoke with many other participants in the preservation and planning and transportation communities. And we tried our best to incorporate uh, all of their uh, comments and suggestions as was feasible and possible. And specifically in response to some of the comments, the very helpful comments that we got from uh, Community Board 5, we did uh, change the cladding, for example, of the um, uh, escalators uh, in our lobby, uh, clad them in stone, which made them much more, we think, uh, we saw it softened down their, their uh, texture and feel and gave them a much more uh, contextual feel within the, uh, within the area of, of the lobby. Um, and as much as we appreciate the feedback that we received, uh, we also wanted to reinforce our confidence in the boldness and the statement of the building. Uh, we're very much uh, aware that um, uh, it's a contemporary building and intentionally so, uh, because we feel that there is a purpose here as others have spoken, I think even more eloquently than I can say now. Uh, we're looking to the future with this, although we are acknowledging the past and we hope that we've incorporated it, the past in a very intelligent uh, way, in a very sensitive way. Uh, the uh, streetscape 
uh, as another example, is also very, very important to us. And we know that CB5 had uh, some comments specific to it. We've addressed the streetscape in both an architectural and a very urbanistic way. It's a, a very active streetscape at the moment. And we feel that some of the gestures that we made in terms of widening the sidewalk, providing additional uh, access uh, into and out of the building, uh, making it very clear as to the various functions, uh, creating opportunities to access both the interior uh, activities as well as the plazas above and transit below are done in a very sensitive and we think very clear way. And all of that has been inspired by the way that Grand Central has so successfully influenced other projects as well. The fact that there is a very complicated system of movement through the building uh, in terms of pedestrian circulation, as well as access to all of the infrastructure, but the way that people are encouraged to move in a seamless uh, and intuitive way has informed the decisions that we've made. And we think that we've done a very good job in making it very clear as to where people go, the options that they have and doing it in a very comfortable and intuitive seamless way. So with that, we'd like to say that we're proud of what we've done. We think that it's an extraordinary building or looking to the future and uh, we're happy to answer any other questions that may come up. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm going to start to request to unmute all of you so that we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. So look for my request and accept it. All right, and uh, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we're gonna begun, begin our discussion. And I wanna, again, thank everyone uh, today who participated. I think that the presentation was very clear and helpful and the testimony was also very thoughtful. So I look forward to our discussion. Um, and just to give us a framework for our discussion mm -hmm. commissioners, just, there are two applications before us. Um, one, as you've heard, is an application for a report to the city planning commission pursuant to section 81. 642 of the zoning resolution concerning the harmonious relationship between a new building and Grand Central Terminal. This is an advisory report because the new building is not designated because the zoning resolution does not require LPC affirmatively find a harmonious relationship. Um, but we will um, have a full discussion and include those comments. The second um, application is for work affecting the landmark site. And that includes the changes to the interior uh, passageway as well as the new sidewalk on the viaduct. And we are advisory on this application because by statute, the MTA, which owns the terminal, is not subject to local land laws. Um, nevertheless, MTA has sought LPC comments. And while we're advisory, you should be applying the appropriateness standards we typically use when considering the appropriateness of these aspects of the work which affects the landmark site. So um, as we comment today, if you can keep your comments in, to, in this framework and separate them into these two groups, one, the, the question and your thoughts on the harmonious relationship, and two, your comments on the proposed work on the landmark site. Mine. Okay. And depending on how Great. that's all. So, here, whoops. Bring I think three, say somebody, three, um, if there is somebody, not a commissioner, if you can mute yourself. Okay. So, commissioners, let's go ahead and start our discussion. We'll just go start at the head of the table and go around. So, Commissioner Devonshire, would you lead the discussion on this one? Sure. Um, with regard to the harmonious relationship. Um, I, I've looked over these drawings. I've, I've really mulled about this a, a great deal. And I, I have a, a fundamental near hatred of the monster towers that are being constructed in New York City. But that's really not part of this discussion. And, and what's part of this discussion for me is the relationship between what we have on the ground and as far as I'm concerned there is there is absolutely no dissonant note between Grand Central Station 
in this new building. And in, in fact, I, I find it, I find the relationship to be separate enough that there, there is a, there is a harmony in, in almost a musical sense to me. There is, there is this massive Grand Central Terminal and this rather ethereal, I mean, I think people are talking about this thing being massive. I don't see it that way at all. And I, and I relish the fact that you can actually see through <coughs> to, the, to the to Grand Central Terminal. And so, you know, I, I was given a little bit of pause by um, Attorney Hiller's statement, and I and it, it I'm a little bit uh, cautious about us making a decision on this on the on the the basis of of what we're being asked to do, if in fact um, it's not something that has a legal basis. Nevertheless in terms of you asking me if I consider this to be harmonious, I say yes, fundamentally. Okay. Um, with regard to the changes on the, the interior, um, I have to say the, the one vestige of Grand Central Terminal that is, is evocative to me of Penn Station, that disgusting piece of transit um, downtown, <laughs> it's that entrance to the subway, which is just hell on earth. And anything that can be done to improve that, I, I think, is, is worthy. And in fact, I think this has been a very, very thoughtful effort on the part of the architects. And I can, I can consider it all appropriate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Sarah. Sarah, can I yes. just make sure everyone's up? Mike, what Michael said, I just want to clarify. Uh, Mr. Hiller's uh, comments were directed to the um, the second application for the interior work um, mm -hmm. yeah, on the station. It didn't have to do with the first harmonious relationship finding that uh, comes to us through the um, zoning resolution, just so everyone's clear. Okay, uh, great. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, you know, as you know, uh, Grand Central is one of the most admired landmarks in the city of New York, and it's a spectacular uh, piece of uh, engineering and architecture. And I, as a matter of fact, go through there every day, even during the pandemic, uh, coming to work. This is a major transfer. So uh, I can identify with what uh, Commissioner Devonshire just said about it is an improvement uh, and I'm glad to see, I forgot all about the earlier biopendable improvement uh, regarding the second part, which is the connection. I think the, uh, the first iteration, I forgot there's a ramp uh, that was uh, dividing the concourse uh, leading into it. So it, it, it is in terms of the improvement of the circulation and improvement of visibility <coughs> landmark, um, it is, um, it is uh, an improvement. Uh, and having said that, I would say that in terms of the harmonious relationship, I can only look at it from the base uh, and, and, uh, because, you know, as uh, Commissioner Devonshire said about the scale of upstairs uh, is, is more of a different matter, whereas versus here, it is uh, what is being presented, obviously, if we look at the analysis of the Grand Central Terminal, it is of a larger scale entrance uh, and the metric, uh, and the staircase leading to the side of the um, one, you know, I'm well, Commissioner Chen, I'm having difficulty hearing you. Maybe if you are speaking closer to the microphone. Is this better? Yeah. yeah, and I think I think Commissioner Chen, you have to repeat some of it because we couldn't hear okay. a bunch of it, so the record's not clear. Yeah. Okay. So uh, as I said, um, uh, related to the second part, uh, uh, I I go. You know, this is one of the you know piece of marvel and engineering wise, as well as uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, is well known uh, worldwide uh, how how nice this is. This is a spectacular piece of landmark in the world and I go through it every day so I can attest to the circulation improvement 
uh, and uh, it's a credit to Bayer Bender Pell for improving the earlier version and which is now uh, hopefully a, 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 uh, the, the proposal seems to be an improvement. Obviously, mm -hmm. there are some areas that uh, we can make improvement suggestions, but obviously we're advisory. Uh, as to, the, um, as to the, the harmonious part, I'm going to just limit myself to the base in terms of, because I'm not speak about what is above because, you know, the rendering and the things like that. Uh, I would say that from the standpoint of relating to the scale and the, the symmetry along 42nd Street in the context between Chrysler Building, between the, the Grand Central and across the street from the Channing Building, there is a, a triangular relationship between the two. So for me, it's almost like you're, you're being bookended by two major landmarks of the world renowned, uh, you know, the beautiful Chrysler building with the gargoyles and the eagles. Uh, and then there's this thing. However, uh, you know, the limitation, the severe limitation, obviously, is that you have to transfer <clears throat> all on these four points. And that is, so I would say the applicant, uh, Skimo Owens, has done a, a beautiful engineering job by unfolding the curtain by treating as a major entrance into, into a major transit hub, you know, the Park, Park Avenue Viaduct. So it is what created Grand Central and it is about what necessity in this instance, the limitation and constraint or the straight jacket in this, this instance. So I think they have done a good job by unveiling the curtain. My concern a little bit is making sure that it does not compete with Grand Central, meaning that this becomes a massive, massive, and so it will, uh, 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 thing. but in a way, I think, <clears throat> I'm glad to hear the applicant uh, 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 made mention to the lowering of the ceiling and comparing, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, uh, paying uh, homage to the, the, the height of the Grand Central and being below that. Uh, that is uh, something that I think could be, could be, um, uh, I, can, I can, I can accept that. Uh, so it, it is, but I would say overall, the, 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 the relationship at the base, based on what is being presented, uh, uh, I can see the Lexington Avenue side, but obviously from this side, I would say, it, 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 I, I agree with Commissioner Devonshire that it, it, it could be considered harmonious. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, well, I have to say that um, before I talk about this building and the it, the harmonious relationship, um, that I'm not gonna be sorry to see uh, the Grand Hyatt leave this location. When I think about um, certain kinds of buildings and architecture that I don't think have had a, a wonderful impact on the, the landscape of the city. Uh, in, in this instance, I would call that building sort of like one of the Darth Vader buildings of New York City. So I'll, I'll be glad to see it go. And, and I, you know, I spent many years trying to understand <laughs> that very narrow passageway <laughs> that led in off of 42nd Street from that building and who was thinking about that? Or there obviously no one was thinking about that because, it was like walking into a funnel and just, you know, I couldn't wait to get through it. Um, so from uh, just in terms of the um, improvements that are being made from a public transportation access standpoint and um, from a, a navigation standpoint, as you move through um, into and through Grand Central, I, I think this has been very successful, is very successful, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing this opening up that we've been um, introduced to today uh, in, in the presentation. Um, and, and it does build on the good work that Barb Linder Bell did because their improvements really 
helped um, make um, the experience of Grand Central sort of more human. And, and it also helped, and the work that they did also um, helped make Grand Central uh, more usable on multiple levels in so many ways. But this will add to that. And I, and I think uh, it, it's gonna be welcomed by many people. And, and the access to the viaduct will be interesting because it will provide an opportunity to uh, really take a closer look at both buildings um, from the outside and just um, provide an opportunity for people to uh, sit and hang out on what is a very busy street and, and intersection. You know, this is a very challenging site and I do have to commend the, the architects for, um, for being very creative and strategic about how they approached it. You know, in some ways I'm not that, I, I have to say, I, I don't entirely love how the building opens up at the bottom. You know, I, I like the reference, I think the reference to uh, the opening as a curtain is uh, um, a nice way to look at it. But when I look at it in relationship to the overall structure, which I, I feel is uh, elegant. Um, it does kind of look like uh, the bloomers or pantaloons. And I wish there were another way it could hit the ground. That, that said, I do think it's successful. And if you, if you look at, um, you know, just, uh, I, I would say page 40 in, in the presentation, you can see that through the, 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 skeleton, the uh, skeleton that's been created and is opened up at the base, that there are actually wonderful views to the side of the building that we've never had before. The ne I would be the next slide. And um, and it's nice to nice to get that. It, it almost gives some breath and air um, to um, to the Grand Central Building that I don't think we were able to experience because it was sandwiched right up against uh, the Grand Hyatt. I like and I like seeing the inner workings of the lobby and uh, that we'll, I love the fact that we'll be able to to see New Yorkers and visitors were, you know, milling through the site to the station to work. I think that's all very successful. Um, I do wanna say, and we haven't really spent any time on the building itself. And I, I know this is not uh, our bailiwick, but this is gonna be a big building. I mean, it's gonna be the second tallest building in the city after the World Trade Center. I think it's gonna be about almost 1600, you know, 40 something feet, 83 stories tall. So it's gonna have a big impact on landscape. <laughs> and I um, am feeling at this moment that it's gonna be a good one. Um, making uh, I think the skeletal structure will help take a building that's gonna have a lot of bulk and make it feel lighter and more porous, not only at the base, but also as you move up. And I do appreciate the nod to um, the, the Chrysler building and, and, the other, and some of the other buildings in the surrounding area that will, I think, help tie it in um, from a forward looking perspective and, 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 a, and a rear view mirror perspective. So I, I think this building is gonna, I think uh, this is gonna work on a number of levels and um, I'm excited about it. All right, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Jefferson, you're muted. I, I, I unmuted myself once again. Uh, this is a, I think this is a 
wonderful project. And it shows what what, what you can do with a high-rise type. You can have a base, and then you have something on top of it. You know? So the base can relate to, to other buildings on the pedestrian level. And at the same time, you could add something on top of it that doesn't have to relate. This, people were talking about harmony. There's no harmony here. This is all contrast. And that contrast is what makes uh, Grand Central so, so visible and powerful. It's because of that contrast. And this, these things coming down, these uh, curtains that are peeled back and this view. I mean, there's lessons to be learned from this, I think. And I think it worked, you know. Um, I'm not so sure about, um, originally I wasn't sure about the stair. I thought maybe it should go in a different axis because it was making this a little too busy, this, this piece. But then I thought, you know, it's fine. It's, it's active, it's different. Um, in terms of the, the, the interiors, I mean, what they're adding to it bringing in natural light and expanding the corridors. I mean, who can complain about that? Just the a zone. nice, good, good job, you know? <laughs> so I, I recommend it. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Commissioner Gustafson. Um, I, I think the first issue that I, that we are all probably trying to grapple with is this question of um, harmonious relationship. Um, and I, and I, I think what I came up with is that, you know, the, the, we can only evaluate harmonious relationship when we experience the, um, the new building and Grand Central together. Um, so that takes out of uh, my purview um, any concern about the, um, you know, the massive um, height of the building, because you can't experience uh, that height except uh, largely um, from a distance. Um, so I'm not worried about whereas I, I i may i may not like the way it looks from from the fdr but that's not the view that we're talking about when we talk about harmonious relationship the experience that we're talking about for a harmonious relationship is the experience of the landmark and this building from the street um and these views and I, this is what we asked for last time we saw this we asked for a much clearer um set of uh, images for these street views and that's what we got um, and what I got from that is that there are at least three points of view from which um, we have um, enhanced um, the public's ability to experience um, the landmark. Um, one being um, the view directly from the east um, uh, or southeast. Uh, one is from the concourse itself. And the third um, is from the views through um, like this. Um, and, um, and so... Um, it has, um, maybe by necessity, it has been designed, it has been engineered to allow us um, these additional views. And in that sense, um, it is um, harmonious and, and at a minimum substantially more harmonious than what preceded it. Um, um, and I understand that some of the people who testified are concerned about, um, seem to conclude that um, any tower um, of this size is non-harmonious, and I don't, I don't see that as the issue. I see, for me, um, I'm concerned about how much of Grand Central I get to see, um, the angles from which I get to see it, um, uh, the exposure of the side of the of the of that building to um, uh, to people on that concourse. I think it's all um, tremendous, and that's harmonious for me. As far as the 42nd Street passage is concerned, um, I set aside all of the, you know, the, 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 um, the reasoning for doing it. The question for me is really um, um, all about materials and proportions. And, um, and these kinds of changes to the passages in Grand Central have been done in several areas, um, and they are very respectful of the materials and the proportions. Um, and, and that's all there is to it. Um, so I find that to be appropriate. All right, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, thanks. So, you know, I, just as others, am struggling a little bit with the term harmonious and a way to, to give it meaning or to interpret it. 
Um, and I think that what the, the way that I, I, and I agree with Commissioner um, Jefferson about this notion of harmonic contrast rather than sort of, um, you know, consonants, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a stronger um, way to think about kind of the notion that there are different, that these are different octave, different scales, different um, keys, and that that's, that, that's, an, that's interesting. It doesn't, um, it doesn't quite help it to get to the definition or to the interpretation of, of, of uh, harmony here. But if you don't mind just turning to page 27, I think it's actually not labeled, but it's after 26. And, um, and it, it's, it's a first, this one, yeah, that was the one, okay. Yeah. And um, so he, here's, a, here's a, a rational thing to do, to take these kind of datum lines from the historic building to, um, to try to understand where there is some kind of relationship, even though the kind of the scale of the materials, the scale of the structure is so very different and, and, and in contrast. Um, so this is interesting because the two data lines are marked, the top of the statue and the, and, the, and the top of kind of the corners before the roof begins. The problem is that when you go to page 40, please, after, the, after you recognize that they've charted that, those data mark, um, when you go to page 40 here, you realize that actually the experience of of Grand Central is truncated. Th those lines that they were carrying or suggesting, at least from what I understand in terms of this rendering, are truncated in terms of what you can see of that, you know, the, 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 the top of the build, top of Grand Central through that dropped kind of plenum that is the under, in a sense, the underside of the, of the space between the structure and, and, the, and the solid um, core. And I think that this is this brings to mind a, a kind of a missed missed opportunity, and, and I would say a hope for like really taking this to a new to another place. Because I I'm in agreement with a, with lots of people who have expressed the possibility that this might have a certain kind of positive heroic quality that that might that, that might be I don't know a, a kind of a good thing. You can talk. Yeah, so, so my issue here has to do with the experience on the plazas and, um, and the ways in which one can um, sort of be with both buildings, but really, really understand um, Grand Central. And I, and you know, the owner of this building is familiar with innovative plazas. Uh, Seagram's didn't have to give up all that ground. It's the generosity of the plaza is spectacular in its defiance of the of the kind of the street wall of Park Avenue. So too, another Skidmore project in Gordon Bunshafts across the way and Lever House with the kind of the turn of of the building again against the rhythm, it, the opening that it created in terms of the kind of the plaza experience or the second floor experience in the case of Lever is so interesting and dramatic and um, and um, and, and, and in a sense, you know, above and beyond what might have been called for, for the sake of, of the public, for the sake of the space. And I think here, this plaza has not been taken all the way. It hasn't gone all the way. Now, maybe all the way, there seems to be a kind of a squeezing. There's a whole lot of circulation. There's a whole lot of escalating escalator. But there really isn't kind of a place to be yet. And I'm not sure if that place to be is a horizontal condition, or in this case, might it be a vertical condition? That if this uh, the underside of this moment here that we're looking at uh, is really, you know, kind of gothic and really towering opening, so that you might be able, and I don't know what this means structurally, obviously, so that you might be able to, to actually see the full height of the building beyond, I think that that will change that will create a harmony of sorts of, of simultaneity of both, both grandeurs, you know, the grandeur of both buildings. And I, I think that that's kind of what's missing here. There's a lot of solving. This solves a lot of issues. It gets the structure where it needs to be. It gets, deals with street wall. It's a fantastic interpretation of the kind of the, the, the curtain wall pulled, pulled away. 
um, in order to, 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 do, to, re to reveal the structure, but also to be able to, to use the space. But I think that the plaza itself needs to go to that next level of true generosity to the public domain and true uh, sort of interact, real harmonic interaction with the sight lines, the, 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 the giant, the grandeur that is Grand Central. Um, so this is where the opportunity is, and um, I, I would hope that they might take it yet one next step. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Halford smith Yes, thank you. <clears throat> well, when I first saw this, of course, I, it took me aback, because um, it is such a massive building. Um, and I you know, I'm, agree with Commissioner Devonshire on the super tall in the city, but that's not what's before us. Um, and I also struggled with the, the massiveness of the columns, but um, I was trying to think about it um, more. And um, I, I think I can appreciate what uh, Commissioner Jefferson said about the contrast, that the harmony between the two is achieved by this contrast. Um, that this, this, so this massive structure that has to come down in these few locations because of the tracks that are below it. Um, they, you know, they've taken that and they've made a very creative um, solution to exposing the structure and making a metaphor for this sort of curtain opening that relates back to the facade of Grand Central. Now, whether that's ever perceived, you know, but maybe not, but it, um, it's a sort of um, a method they use to help um, sort of organize the, the facade. Um, but I think that the, I, that I can find the harmonious relationship um, is that the, the building is respect, is a, you know, it is a massive building, but it's respectful of Grand Central and it gives the landmark breathing room and the ability to see it in the round that we've lost for all these years with the old Hyatt that was just sort of smack up against it. Um, and I think being able to activate that upper level um, will be really, you know, be able to experience both buildings and other buildings in, in the, in the you know, Midtown area move from a unique vantage point that I think is, um, will be a great amenity. Um, and as far as the uh, 42nd Street passage, I think that it's, it's appropriate in the way it relates to the existing architecture. And, you know, it'll obviously open up more, more space for what's needed now and for increased um, ridership um, through Grand Central in the future. So I can find the way they've done that to be um, appropriate as well. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. All right. Well, I, I must have been at a different different uh, presentation. I apologize, but I I have a very I have a different view, and I have I had to write it down. So forgive me. Um, the code section that's cited requires uh, the uh, harmonious relationship. It, it it is an open ended requirement. It doesn't specify a scope or a limit. In my opinion, the way I read the regulation, uh, evidently, customarily, we are uh, intended to look at it as a streetscape effect or a, a from the street view. I don't see that uh, in the in the text or in the context of the regulation. Uh, the phrase is used elsewhere in the zoning resolution for similar purposes, without any explicit or implied definitions or restrictions. So I question our limiting our view to the base. Uh, without seeing city planning documentation, that was the intention of the language. It, you know, just a, a, on a plain reading of the text, it, I don't see it. So I, I personally don't understand why, uh, why that, or it doesn't make any sense to me why that would be the limitation on the, on the evaluation. Um, I, there's no doubt that the city zoning code encourages the, the modification of this property into a very large building while at the same time, it imposes a requirement for some kind of historically sensitive relationship to the unique site. It didn't have to do that. I don't think that this site can't be uh, have, an, have a large building on it. A skilled 
sensitive modern design can successfully relate to a historic environment while creating a new scale in a modern expression. This project, in my opinion, is a textbook definition of a dissonant relationship between a landmark and a new development. Scale, massing, material, detail, historic precedent are all, in gross terms, the way we evaluate relationships between old buildings and new ones. By every measure, in my opinion, this proposal fails to meet anything that I could conceive of as harmonious. The design is scaleless, introverted, and anonymous. I don't think it should be built on this site. The scale reminds me of Constantine's head in Rome. The head looks like a head, it has proportion, it's internally consistent, but it's 10 feet tall, which is bigger than any head I've ever encountered in my life. And it's that scale, it's the disparity in the scale that makes the impression. And you can't disregard that when putting that head next to my head. <clears throat> By the same token, I just, you know, there's no escaping that this building is very big. Its purported relationships with Grand Central all occur at the very bottom of the very base of this design, the gathered curtains that, that below the mostly straight banded uh, vertically oriented building above. The scale of the gestures is evaluated by looking at the entire building. Relative to that, the terminal is in a different universe. The proposed design totally changes the scale of its environs, resetting the metric for the landmark, making the terminal look small and out of scale. The unfortunate diagram in the presentation that referred to symmetry, I don't remember what page that was, revealed this depressing effect. Flanked by one, one Vanderbilt, and now this, the city will have made the terminal look shrunk and forlorn like those photographs of cranky holdouts in boomtown Chinese cities, rabidly clinging to their homely homesteads, artifacts standing astride the rush of progress. The massing <clears throat> emphasizes this scalelessness. The flat, undifferentiated 42nd Street facade rises from street to the top, almost as a single, slightly undulating plane, is completely antithetical to the area and to Grand Central. The most of the streetscapes that have framed Grand Central since it was built have had a three-dimensional character with ins and outs, courtyards, variations in skyline. The Commodore Hotel, like many of the other buildings in Terminal City, were, was, was deeply articulated with uh, masses that rose towards the sky in, in, with scale and with proportion. The Chrysler Building similarly has setbacks and has an interplay of volumes as it rises. The massings break down the scale of these buildings, which are big buildings, making the terminal seem big, even though it's the lowest building in the group. One, one Vanderbilt, as you can see from this image, at least gestures in that direction with its deeply recessed base, its not <laughs> corners. There's a sense of relationship to its environs that is uh, at least gesturing towards effective. The massings break down the scale of these buildings, <laughs> making the terminal seem big. The building's street walls are, this building's street walls are sheer all the way to the top, uh, slipping over the setbacks like a melting ice pop. The mass base of, is similarly problematic for me. The new building continues the plinth by flipping up the expression of a vertical solid wall at Grand Central into a horizontal plane that slopes down with a glass infill below. The design takes away the weight of a plinth, which is its, you know, it, it's, its vertical, its visual, job is to support the thing on top with a box, instead replacing it with a design that reminds me of symmetrical highway off ramps, uh, open underneath, glazed, penetrated. It, it, it to me defies the base, it doesn't extend it. The material and detail similarly um, are antithetical to the mostly masonry context of Grand Central and to the environment, even the Pan Am building hardly a contextual structure, integrates masonry into its banal fabric. The cable-like steel piers have turned a seriously adventurous, exciting structural scheme into a swooping decorative design that reminds me of Minoru Yamasaki with, with its symmetry and its kind of neo-Gothic top. I don't see how that design rel language relates in any way to Grand Central's Bo Beaux-Arts design. The historical precedent similarly, it doesn't work. 
the original terminal city design shows us exactly what the designers and planners who created Grand Central would have considered a harmonious relationship between a terminal and its environs. The original design originally was low rise, set at a height similar to the station itself. The realized terminal city buildings were higher, but their uniform height, massing and detailing and materiality enabled the setting to frame and aggrandize the terminal being secondary to the terminal, even though they were bigger. The Commodore was part of that ensemble. This volume still reads through the tacky glass facades, harmonizing at, harmonizing at the level of massing and scale, even as it lacks detail or materiality. No such statement can be made for this proposal. Even the setbacks don't gesture to the uh, terminal city buildings that are still extant, operating instead on a scale wholly internal to its own anomalous proportioning system. So for all these reasons, it's my view that this project is disharmonious, as disharmonious as it could be to New York City's most important landmark. The proposed changes at the concourse level seem modest and sensitive. The skylights are not intrusive to the concourse. The interior modifications generally deserve a positive report, I think. They maintain the identity of the landmark while opening it to new development. My only request is that the team work with the work on the definition of that volume of that passageway as it moves north to align with the main concourse. That definition kind of falls apart as you get beyond the, um, the, the ramp down to the lower level. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, I'm sorry I skipped over you, so please go ahead. <laughs> It's okay. Uh, well, I have a different uh, view than Michael. It took me a while to get there. But anyway, I think that uh, at first, I think it's an extremely thoughtful approach. Um, I don't find that the height in itself makes it non-harmonious since Grand Central exists in an environment of multiple tall buildings and skyscrapers. And the previous buildings on this site included the Grand Hyatt, including the Grand Hyatt were tall structures. And while this is much taller, I don't think the difference in tallness uh, makes it automatically non-harmonious. I did have to get beyond its striking design, the striking design of the new building to, cut, to look at the details and elements that I could find harmonious. And what I do find harmonic resonance in the design is the masonry plinth, which creates a simplified modern echo of elements of the terminal and its rhythm of solids and voids, while its lower height and setback from the street, I think helped to keep it subordinate to the terminal. I think its scale allows the front of the terminal to preserve the terminal's monumental prominence in the streetscape. The open column uh, supported base opens up views of the terminal, which are not, were not possible with the Grand Hyatt or would, be, would, would not be possible with uh, any uh, construction that didn't have a lot of openness to the, uh, to the design at the bottom. I think the matte tone uh, metal of the panels is uh, warmer and non-reflective and more harmonious with the terminal as a result with the, uh, with the uh, masonry uh, of the terminal. I think that the new almost 24,000 square feet of surrounding public access space, which permits uh, pedestrian views of the Eastern side of the terminal, both visually and, uh, and uh, physically, is a very important improvement to access to this historic building. I think that the fact that the new building is visible in the round for me resonates with the design of the terminal, which is also intended to be visible in the round. Uh, the geometries and rhythm of the new structure, in my view, echo Art Deco elements, the uh, diamonds, the triangles, the rectangles of the steel structure. Oddly enough, somehow its design serves memories of the Chrysler building for me, even though it obviously looks nothing like the Chrysler building. But I, I see these geometric, the ge geometries and rhythm as somehow having an echo to non -de uh, Art Deco design. The interior design, uh, uh, the design of the interior, uh, creating uh, new larger circulation spaces and openings, I find totally appropriate and necessary to open up the circulation and flow of the interior. 
And I think that the changes are in no way destructive of historic materials or of the historic design approach. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you all commissioners for your thoughtful comments and on, on the many aspects of these two applications. So I think where we are is we have a consensus to approve the changes to the interior. And I think we also have um, enough votes to um, issue a favorable report concerning the harmonious relationship. And I think what we'll do is Commissioner Devonshire, if you could make the motion on the interior, the, it's the, the second report, and I'll do the motion on the harmonious relationship. We have some basic ideas. And I think what we will do is also after this incorporate all of the comments that we've heard as well into that so that um, anything that's missing in the base findings that we have can be um, fleshed out to really reflect your comments. Um, and before we get to the motions, I do want to just um, note for the record that the presentations were um, emailed as all presentations are to the commissioners in advance of the hearing. And so um, as some commissioners talked about seeing this before, that was not done in a group or any pub, any um, group setting or in any um, environment in which the commissioners spoke to each other. The commissioners looked at these individually and um, some did ask for some additional materials if they looked for them. So just wanted to note that for the record. Okay, and, and Sarah, Sarah just, yes. just, and just further note that, that all those conversations were solely with, with staff. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. So Commissioner Devonshire, would you make the second motion? Sure. Matter of LPC 2105603, 71105 East 42nd Street, Grand Central Terminal, an individual and interior landmark. An application to alter the viaduct sidewalk and the 42nd Street passage to connect to an adjacent new building. I find that the work will help improve and expand public accessibility without eliminating or damaging any significant architectural features. That the retention of the historic balustrade and handrail will maintain visual cues to the original footprint of the upper level of the terminal. The replacement of the existing modern paving and bollards with new paving and bollards adjoining the new paving at the proposed neighboring building will be a minor alteration, which will not detract from any design features of the building. That the enlargement of select openings on the interior corridor and el elimination of infill at these bays will not significantly di diminish the sense of solidity of this wall that the enlarged openings for the new passageways will be consistent with the existing passageway openings throughout the terminal corridors in terms of scale and will relate well to the historic circulation pattern of the corridors. That the proposed details, materials and finishes of the enlarged opening surrounds will match the historic details, materials and finishes, thereby helping to maintain the unity of the design that the simply designed glass infill within an existing opening will maintain a sense of the void to be compatible with the infill at storefront bays throughout the corridor. And that the cumulative effect of the modifications will not detract from the special historic and architectural character of this designated individual and interior landmark. All right, Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second it. Thank you. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Jefferson, are you there? You are muted. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford-Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. All right, thank you. And so that, that one is um, approved and will issue a favorable report. Okay, and my in the matter of docket number 21-05602, 
71 to 105 East 42nd Street, Grand Central Terminal, Individual and Interior Landmark, a French Beaux-Arts style railroad terminal designed by Reed and Stem and Warren and Wetmore and built in 1903 to 13. Application is for an advisory review pursuant to zoning resolution section 81 6 I believe it's 642, concerning the harmonious relationship of the new building and Grand Central Terminal. With respect to the relationship between the new building and Grand Central Terminal, I find that the form and materiality of the new building featuring a wide plinth with a narrower center, centered tower and large expanses of clear glazing aligning with the upper level of Grand Central Terminal will enhance views of the terminal from the east, which are currently obscured by the existing building, that the elevated public terrace near the east side of the terminal will enhance the public's ability to appreciate the design and form of the historic terminal by providing new access to the east facade, that cinching, the cinching of the tower structure at the base of the building will allow views of the east facade of the terminal through the new building, that the alignment of the proposed building's plinth with the terminal's plinth will help to provide harmonious scale relationships between the base of the new building and the terminal. That the material and finish of the stone cladding of the core and base of the building will relate well to the historic terminal's material and finish palettes. That the muted tones of the proposed stone cladding and painted metal clad structural elements combined with their modern detailing will help to be harmonious with the historic material and finish, finish palette of the terminal while also maintaining a clear distinction between the historic, adjoining historic and modern plinth. That the cumulative effect of the detailing, including the tapering and fluting of the metal clad structural framing and the diagonal grid frame of the glazing system will help the base of the tower to maintain a human scale and level of ornamentation, which will be harmonious with the scale and ornamentation of the terminal, and that the presence of this architecturally prominent building designed with the contemporary materials and forms, while subtly referencing significant architectural features of Grand Central Terminal, will be a strong counterpoint or harmonic contrast, harmonic contrast to this important individual landmark uh, without diminishing its prominence and allowing it to be read in the round. And um, as I said, we can also add um, some of the other comments that we heard today on the harmonious relationship to flush that out a little bit more. Um, but with that, Commissioner uh, Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, thank you. And um, Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, I'm sorry, I, I still would want for it to be incorporated, the, the, the notion of actually um, being able to render more height underneath the, um, in what would be okay. the, kind of the mezzanine area. Yeah. Is there any way that that can be requested? So yeah. we'll see where we'll, uh, what we'll do is we'll see if we have six on this a motion for a favorable report and otherwise add any other comments if we don't. So, so can we pass we for a moment? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'll come back. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Sorry, can you repeat that? Aye, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Nay. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. And Commissioner Shamir Barron? Well, so Chair Carroll, what should I do? Um, so I think, um, I think if you feel strongly that the relationship is not um, harmonious and that it would um, benefit <laughs> from this further elevation at the base, then I would vote nay on this. Nay. Okay. With eight in favor and two opposed, the motion carries. All right, great, thank you. So we will um, prepare that and we have one more item for the day. So we'll move on to the next item. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And the last item of the day is